Gladstone Regional Council are committed to fostering a proud, involved and engaged community. The Gladstone Regional Council Community Investment Program provides financial support to local community initiatives, projects and events which promote community connections, regional enhancements, community celebrations and community education. For more information on the Community Investment Program, visit gladstone.qld.gov.au. Gladstone Regional Council. Connect. Innovate. Diversify. Illegal dumping and littering is a concern across the Gladstone region, with over 134 offences in the last 18 months. Our region is beautiful, but there are a few bad apples that ruin it for the rest of us, and they need to clean up their act. Commonly found items at illegal dumping sites across the region include car bodies and batteries, mattresses, tyres, white goods and furniture, and green waste. These items can be disposed of at any of the region's waste transfer stations, some of them even for free. Illegal dumping and littering pollutes our environment, harms plants and animals, and detracts from the enjoyment of our public spaces. It can lead to stormwater and ocean pollution with large amounts of plastic, sugar sachets, and cigarette butts caught in stormwater traps and grates. It's cheaper for everyone to dispose of waste correctly. Illegal dumping and littering cost our ratepayers thousands of dollars each year in waste management and cleanup. It's also costly for our dumper with penalties of up to $10,000. We can all work together to keep our region beautiful and dispose of waste responsibly by placing rubbish in the bins or even holding onto the rubbish until you're near a suitable bin and using our local waste facilities. Don't be part of the problem of pollution 
We want you to be a part of the solution. From towns to the bush, illegal dumping and littering is everybody's responsibility. Protect our public spaces and natural environment by doing the right thing for today and tomorrow. If you see illegal dumping, dob in a dumper. See it, report it, stop, stop it. it. Sign up to Council's Disaster and Weather Event Warning System. Receive alerts about emergency news, severe weather events and other public safety alerts via SMS or email. Registering to the Disaster Messaging System is free. To register, visit Gladstone Regional Council's Region Watch website and click on the Register for Warnings button. Get ready, Gladstone. Take the steps to protect what's most important to you. Let's be better prepared and protected for emergencies and disasters.
Well, good morning. The time being 9am, I declare open the general meeting for the Gladstone Regional Council for the 16th of May 2023. Actually, five past nine this morning. We had a few technical issues with our live stream, um, but it is working mostly now. So thank you, councillors. Uh, we have no apologies. However, we do have Councillor Grady um, participating via Teams. And also, thanks to our techs, we have um, the phone working for Councillor O'Grady as well. So we'll be keeping an eye on the screen for your hand up, Councillor O'Grady, in case you need to participate or ask a question. Um, councillors, the next item on the agenda is messages of condolence. Do we have any messages of condolence? No messages of condolence. The next item on the agenda is prior notifications of conflicts of interest. And I have received a conflict of interest from Councillor Goodluck. Over to you, Councillor Goodluck. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I, Councillor Khan Goodluck, inform the meeting that I have a prescribed conflict of interest in agenda item G slash 4.6 Community Investment Program funding applications and item G slash 4.7 um, Regional Arts Development Fund round 1 2022 and 2023 as I am the president of the Boyntanum Arts Business and Community Association Inc whose application for funding uh, for both of those item numbers um, will be considered for the Under the Trees event um, and I will leave the room for the consideration of both those items but I would like to request um, given that there is a number of other items on those agendas, Mr Mayor, if, if uh, the room would be happy to split the items, that would be uh, appreciated. Thank you, Councillor. Good luck. Um, after we go through the rest of the conflicts, i am be more than happy to split that item. Next, uh, we have Councillor Churchill. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Mayor Matt. I, Councillor Glenn Churchill, inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in agenda yes. item G4.7, Regional Arts Development Fund Round 1 2022-2023, which is for the Gladstone Independent Schools Music Association, has submitted an application for funding for their Gizma Instrumental Music Workshop for 2023. As a member of the International Percussion Society and as a qualified accomplished drummer, I have offered my volunteer services to the Gladstone Independent Schools Music Association for part of the week-long workshops in June as an honorary percussion tutor and performer to help develop aspiring and keen musicians. I receive no remuneration for this service and I have uh, also declared the same conflict at the RADF committee meeting. I believe that my personal interest will not affect my ability and judgment to participate in this decision in the best interest of the public and accordingly I request to stay in the chambers for the consideration of the item subject to the will of my peers. Thank you, Councillor Churchill. I don't believe you have a conflict that would require you to leave the room um, and I'm happy to move that way, that no conflict exists. Seconded, Councillor, good luck. Any further questions for Councillor Churchill? Put the motion all in favour. Motion's carried. Councillor Churchill, you can remain in the room. Councillor Hanson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. I, Councillor Rick Hanson, declare that I have a prescribed conflict of interest in agenda item G4.6, Community Investment Program Funding Applications, as my wife, Lyndall Hanson, is CEO for not for profit House, whose application for funding will be considered as part of G4.46. I will leave the room for the consideration of this item, but I, like Councillor Goodluck, would like to have those items split up if I could so that I could attend the others. Thank yeah, you, Mr absolutely. Mayor. And also remind people while I'm here, other councillors while I'm here, that there are two items in there from GAPDL and I'm on the board of GAPDL, the APDL as an appointed member of Gladstone Regional Council. Thank you. Um, we can deal with the not-for-profit house conflict, um, separate those items, and there is no conflict with GAPDL as you're a council appointed. Uh, member to the board. Councillor Muscat. Uh, good morning and thank you. Um, I, Councillor Natalia Muscat, inform the meeting that I have a prescribed conflict of interest in agenda item G4.6, Community Investment Program Funding Applications, as I'm a director of Strong Communities LTD, who will directly benefit from an application for funding from GAPDL and this application will be considered as part of this item. I will leave the room for the consideration of um, the, uh, well, I will also, similar to Councillor Goodluck and Councillor Hansen will like to split the, 
the items so I can be able, uh, I'm able to discuss the other applications. Thank you, Councillor Muscat. But I will leave for when um, mine, the Strong Communities one is, or GAPDL Strong Communities one is discussed. Thank you. Thank you. So, I've got Councillor Goodluck um, leaving for the BTABC item in 4.6 and 4.7. Councillor Hanson, 4.6 for not-for-profit house and Councillor Muscat for the 4.6 GAPDL and we'll split those items when we get to them. It's going to be a very interesting item. <laughs> Councillors, am I going to have a... I suppose, yes, we'll have a quorum on and off. <laughs> thank you. Um, any further conflicts of interest, councillors? Councillor Branthwaite. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, hi, Councillor Darrell Branthwaite. In the past, I've had a prescribed um, conflict of interest with items pertaining to GAPDL and the tourism aspect side of things. Um, and today is different, dealing with a different item, and I'd really like to be able to participate in that meeting uh, considering it really doesn't have any effect on me or anybody else, sorry. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Councillor Brento, you just need to declare the nature of your um, conflict of interest in relation to this item. Oh, this purely by association with um, um, GAPDL. GAPDL uh, handle um, some minor bookings for my, for my, for my business um, and um, on the tourism side of things, and this is... Uh, to do with C for C, which is completely different. Just confirming that um, this conflict of interest is a declarable conflict, conflict of, of interest. interest. Okay, not a prescribed. Yeah. So it's up to the boardroom whether Councillor Branthwaite can remain. That's correct. Right, okay. Questions to Councillor Branthwaite, please. Sorry. Councillor Muscat. Uh, it was just um, because it, I understand there's two items. Mm -hmm. So one is, it is tourism related. And the other one isn't, definitely. But I guess well, we had this conversation before, but the, as a member of um, GAPDL and this application doesn't necessarily, um, you know, provide a gain or a loss to uh, Councillor Brett White's business. So it could also, it, we could also consider that he might be able to, in the tourism part of it, he might be able to participate but not vote maybe in that in that item, if that would be yep. something. Um, yeah, there is an item in there regarding uh, request of event equipment yeah, for yeah. GAPDL. That's yeah. what, yeah, there's two. Two separate items. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I can leave the room. To save all that hassle. For the events one? Yeah. And stay for the Communities for Children one? Yes, it could do. Okay, that's... <laughs> Whatever you want me to do. <laughs> no, uh, that's fine. So I'm just going to write that. Is for, which, which is the events 4.6? GAPDL. Yeah. yeah, okay. Daryl will leave the room. And then for C for C... You would like to remain, and I still will need a motion with the councillor. Thank you, Councillor Churchill. Happy to move a motion that Councillor Branthwaite does not have a, a conflict in relation to the agenda item that's relevant to the C4C. Right, I can't, I can't move, move that. Right, okay then. Well, he's. Well, I'm happy to move whatever motion is required <laughs> appropriately so Councillor Branthwaite can effectively stay in the room for the C4C matter in relation to the agenda item. That's Hopefully, the, uh, Rachel, it, you'll be able to get something out of that terminology. Happy to move that. Can we um, see that actual motion? Or so the motion will be that you move that Councillor Branthwaite remain in the room. Simple as that. Yes, I'll come mm. to you in a second. I just wanted to hear what well, the motion is. Well, understanding that he can't, he's declared a prescribed conflict uh, or declarable conflict on the other one, but he can't stay in the room for that. So I'm happy to move that he can remain in the room for. Uh, the agenda item for C for C. Yes, 4.7. Thank you, Councillor Buscat, question? Um, yeah, I just um, have a question for our team here because I have just declared a conflict, so I, sh I, I won't be voting. Point, point okay. of order, Mayor Matt. Yeah. You, you, are you going to get a second for my motion? I before am, we but proceed? I just need a declarification for Councillor Muscat whether she could even second it or not, and she obviously yeah. can't. And I think that up might apply to others too, well. for example. So just to make sure that we not, we it's clear that we have not voted. Is that that will include <coughs> Councillor Goodluck too, then, because he has a conflict in 4.7. Do I have a quorum? But we, if we're going to split the items, um, sorry, Mr. Mayor, then the only item that I've got a conflict in is that. 
one of item 4.6. Can I maybe propose you, that um, you submit a, a procedural, you pass a procedural motion to split those items now, split the agenda item, and then you can consider. I hope someone in Brisbane's watching this. Merits. So they can <laughs> see what they've done. Well, they create, they create the government. The, the anyway. Um, uh, I, I, no, I don't think I necessarily need to. I have Councillor O'Grady, Councillor um, Cameron, myself, Councillor Trevor and Councillor Churchill, which is a quorum. I'm not splitting the motion now. I'm going to carry on with my quorum. Um, can I, I have a mover in Councillor Churchill that Councillor Brainsway can remain in the room for C for C. With the balance of my councillors, can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Cameron. I'll put the motion all in favour. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, though, but I'll, I'll split the motion when the time is appropriate at, when we get to it. Nothing wrong with being involved in your local community, councillors. I think that's fantastic. That's why the community elected you. No more conflicts. <laughs> Councillor O'Grady, um, you can hear us online now? Excellent. And no conflicts to declare? <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> we'll continue on with the agenda. Thank you, councillors. The next item on the agenda before we go to our deputation uh, and the minutes of the last meeting is a mere statement on current issues. And I'd like to um, I thank the opposition leader for Queensland, David Christofulli, for uh, visiting Gladstone on Thursday, the 4th of May. I caught up with Dave and updated him on a number of local issues and challenges. And of course, um, updated him on the pipeline of projects planned for central Queensland, particularly in the renewable sector. Dave was in town to attend a meeting with community regarding maternity services in the Gladstone Hospital. As many would know, for some time, many mothers have not been able to have their babies locally, due mostly to a lack of obstetric services at the Gladstone Hospital. Uh, since that meeting, I've been advised by the member for Gladstone, uh, Mr Glenn Butcher, that 62% of babies are now being born in the Gladstone Hospital. However, high-risk babies are still being referred to Rockhampton. Glenn has advised that the Central Queensland Health and Hospital Service has also signed a number of obstetricians who are currently awaiting approval from the Obstetric College, AMPRA, and the visa process, however, this takes time. So it is fantastic to see babies delivered in our Gladstone region again, um, and I look forward to that service returning to 100% of babies being delivered in our Gladstone region. There is absolutely no reason why a region and a city our size should, um, um, should not be able to have babies here, and I thank Glenn for that update. Uh, we also had a visit from the, the Minister for Employment, Small Business, um, Training and Skills Development, Di Farmer, who attended our meeting um, the greatest networking function, I believe it was called, the biggest networking function at the Gladstone Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I also um, caught up with councillors and some of our local trainees and apprentices who are funded under the Skilling Queenslanders for Work program. Recently, I participated in the Bella, for, uh, Bella the Brave Fun Run uh, at the Millennium Esplanade uh, with many other locals raising funds uh, and, and, and council staff members and councillors as well. I thank them for their participation as well, uh, raising funds for uh, childhood cancer. And I'm I thank the team for organising the event there. It's um, uh, returned after COVID break and it was a huge event this year, including a half marathon, which I did not participate in. Uh, I did the 5K run. Maybe next year we'll do the 10. On um, Thursday, the 11th of May, was a huge day for the Gladstone region, especially for our Gladstone airport, as we had our first direct flight to Melbourne, uh, thanks to Bonza. So I'm encouraging everyone in the Gladstone region, this is an opportunity to visit friends and family and invite them to Gladstone as well. Um, direct to Melbourne um, is something we um, really appreciate in this region. And if this is successful, you might see the return of direct flights to Sydney and also a northern flight perhaps to Townsville or Cairns. Um, I know many people have asked, what well, can they do flights to Brisbane? Uh, that is not what Bonds is about. They're not about competing with the major two. They're about creating new, um, new opportunities and new options for uh, local commuters around Queensland and around Australia. And so this flight to Melbourne is one we need to support and hopefully then we'll see other legs that the other two are not interested in uh, pursuing. Uh, later this week, I'll be attending um, the Energy Minister's meeting in Alice Springs. As the uh, Vice President of the Australian Local Government Association, uh, I will represent all 537 councils in the country with all energy ministers, uh, state and federal, uh, across the country to talk energy and very timely and appropriate uh, for the Gladstone region considering the energy transition we're going through right at this moment. And of course, later this month, it's the Santos GLNG Mayor's Charity Ball. And I want to thank the team of the Gladstone Entertainment Convention Centre, our volunteer committee, uh, for everything they've done to put this event together. It's going to be a very successful night, I have no doubt, raising funds for three local charities. And thank you, Councillor O'Grady. I know uh, you've been representing me on that committee. Thank you, Councillors. That is the Mayor's statement on current issues. Uh, the final item before we move to our deputation is G2.1, which is a confirmation of the general meeting minutes for the 2nd of May 2023. Can I have a mover, please? 
Moved Councillor Hanson, seconded Councillor Trevor. All in favour? Motion's carried. Thank you, councillors. And uh, the next item on our agenda is our deputation. And today we have a deputation from Anglicare Central Queensland. And I welcome, welcome Carol and Adam, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mayor Burnett, councillors, managers, and community representatives. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians on whose land we are meeting um, this morning. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the, tr the traditional custodians right across central Queensland where Anglicare CQ serves. Um, I'm Carol, I'm CEO at Anglicare CQ and this is Adam who is our Housing and Homelessness Manager. Uh, we're looking forward to having a really good discussion with you this morning about partnering with Anglicare CQ to deliver a social housing option here in Gladstone. Now largely we will speak to our briefing paper. We will go a little bit rogue from time to time to give you a little bit more context about what we're proposing. But we welcome questions right the way through the session so you can get the most out of um, what we've got to present this morning. Now, firstly, a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, Anglicare CQ have served, has served Central Queensland now for almost 40 years. In fact, it's our 40th birthday next year. Uh, we operate from the Capricorn Coast right through Rockhampton to here in Gladstone and all the way out west to Longreach and we have several offices that are peppered throughout that geographical location. We have a team of 200 staff and they are both paid and unpaid and we have a capable and competent um, committed board in play. Um, we pride ourselves on living and working within the communities that we serve. Now we have a whole range of services that we do offer. Um, we, we're talking about housing today but it's not um, you know, a standalone um, program and um, you know the, the programs that we offer are really about ensuring we can deliver on our vision, which is about working with people to make the best of their lives. I am going to unpack a little bit about the service offering we have because it is important. Um, and I think it just gives you a little understanding of the diversity that Anglicare CQ offers to community. So we have quite a lot of child protection services. So that's foster, kinship and intensive foster care, including residential care programs. Uh, we have mental health, suicide prevention, and also a headspace out in Emerald. We have counselling, family support and youth programs, emergency relief and financial resilience programs, and of course, housing and homelessness programs. Um, we are really passionate housing people. Um, we believe housing is the foundation of everything. Um, and without that roof over someone's head, it's incredibly difficult for them to build on the other aspects of their lives. So the wraparound supports that I've, I've mentioned that Anglicare provide, um, they tuck in alongside of the housing that, that um, we provide to really ensure that we can move someone from a position of just surviving to thriving and being able to more actively contribute to community. We are also passionate advocates and in the last few years, the last five years to be a little bit more precise, we have af actively advocated around the housing crisis that um, you know, is not only happening in Queensland but Australia wide. We have specifically elevated the regional perspective and we've felt that that's been really important for policy makers to be aware that how the housing crisis doesn't just hit capital cities, it doesn't just hit, hit the southeast corner, but it impacts on regional communities like Gladstone um, as well. I am going to unpack a little bit about the housing crisis. I'm sure most of you will have a fair understanding about it, but I think it's really important that we have a Gladstone um, spotlight what's happening in this community so that we can understand what Anglicare is, is I guess, trying um, to resolve, what issue we're trying to, to put some ease um, towards. Over the last five years specifically, uh, we've seen affordability and availability when it's come to housing really tighten. Um, housing stock on the ground has not matched the, the growth in population and there's been quite a shortfall there, particularly in the social housing products. Um, demand is outstripping supply and that's really kicking prices up across all aspects um, of the housing system. So it is fair to say that we are in the thick of a housing crisis. Um, it's also fair to say that we should all around this table in this room um, expect the housing crisis to only worsen over the next couple of years and that communities like Gladstone will not be immune to this situation. Um, I'm now going to unpack the housing crisis from a figures perspective so we can really see what's happening here in the Gladstone community. Um, private rental um, vacancy rates has, have hovered around the 2% mark since August 2020. Anything below 2% is really tight. Um, the rental price increases in the, oh, sorry, 
Uh, Councillor, have you got a, got a question? Oh, I just want to make sure, because I do, I can. Oh, so once I get okay. into things, I really <laughs> hit my straps. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oh, as long as you, yeah. Um, now, this statistic is a really damning statistic, so it was right at a really important punchy part. Um, but our rental prices um, here in Gladstone, you know, are really, really significant. So what we've we've seen is that the percentage increases here in Gladstone are between 51 and 87 percent. That's been in the last five years. These are the highest percentage rate increases in the state. Um, we also have 50% less affordable housing options available. Um, Anglicare CQ recently undertook a rental affordability snapshot. We did that in the last couple of months. Um, that was to look at um, private rentals that were available right across central Queensland. What we became aware of is affordability is you know, absolutely not on the table whatsoever. Um, in um, central Queensland, 0% of private rentals were affordable for those on a disability support pension um, or an aged care pension. So there was nothing available for that, um, for that group. Um, the if that's not bad enough, the National Rental Affordability Scheme is winding down nationally. Uh, that's an affordable housing product and there's no substitute for that um, option coming into play. What that means for Gladstone um, alone is that we work with 90 households here that are currently uh, being housed within that scheme. There are nil to limited exit points um, for those households and many of, of these um, tenants are pensioners. Um, the other statistic that's really concerning is in the last five years, our social housing wait lists here in Gladstone have doubled. So we've got around 650 people in this community that do not have stable housing. Um, if you look at across Queensland, that's 50,000. So you think about the population of Gladstone, um, that, you know, compared to that, um, there's a fair few people that don't have stable accommodation. Parallel to the housing crisis, we also have infrastructure projects coming into the region. That's a really positive step. We have no issue around that. We absolutely welcome the benefits that infrastructure projects bring to community, but they also bring workers into community that need to be housed. So that means, um, you know, our housing system already stretched um, gets, um, you know, pushed push to a point of um, hemorrhaging. So the housing crisis has particularly motivated the team at Anglicare CQ to get in there and do something about it. Um, and we've reached out to all levels of government, local, state and federal, to partner with us in order to look at um, increased housing solutions on the ground. We have met with a number of councils and representatives from council, which has been absolutely fantastic. We've had some really positive um, conversations. People have a real passion around um, housing and wanting to be involved. So we've met with councils such as Livingston, Rockhampton, and of course, um, Gladstone. I will say that Livingston Shire, and this is putting a challenge out to Gladstone um, Shire here, but Livingston have really come to the table and have partnered with Anglicare CQ. Um, they have gifted us two blocks of land, one in Yapoon, one in Emu Park, and we will partner with them to develop, to develop those blocks for both social and affordable housing. Um, we're really keen to do something like that in Gladstone as well, um, where we can work with um, the council and look at an affordable housing option here for your older um, group, and we, we received some feedback from your representatives about, uh, you, know, um, you know, what might be the best, uh, you know, this um, area for us to focus on and being able to provide something that enables those that um, are wanting to age in place is something that's um, obviously fairly important to, to Gladstone and something we want to support. So I won't sort of go on um, too much for, oh, yes, Councillor, good luck. You, yeah. <laughs> Welcome your question. Sorry, thank you. Um, just, I was wondering if you might be able to just elaborate a little bit on the National Rental Affordability Scheme, yeah. uh, how it's winding down, uh, and, and for those that might be watching that don't understand exactly what that means, could you just let us know what's happening in that space? Yeah, oh, Adam, you, Adam oversees the program, so... Yeah. yeah, so the National Rental ha Affordability Scheme is a, a federally funded pro uh, program. Um, it was put in place for a 10-year period where owners would get uh, tax incentives to offer their property at 25% less than, than the market rent. Um, so Gladstone had a pretty big uptake of, of that program. We have about 90, as Carol mentioned, left in, in, in that program. Um, but those 10-year 
the 10 year plan expires over the next couple of years. So by 2025, um, Gladstone won't have any of those affordable housing products. And as Carol mentioned, uh, the particular concern is around the pensioners that we've got in those, in those properties, um, being able to afford the alternative. So rents will increase and they will go up to the, to the market rental price, which is uh, continually increasing as it is. Um, so our concern is, you know, where do these people go once once they exit that scheme? And Gladstone's heading into that transition phase now. Uh, Rockhampton sort of, we've been in it. We've seen we've seen what happens through the Rockhampton process. They'll be all expired by the end of the year. Gladstone's, you know, next off the list. So, <clears throat> further councillors' questions. Further questions, councillors. Even councillor Muscat. No, um, it's not really a question, but a bit of. Yeah, it's that seemed very interesting, and that's probably a, uh, something that not lo not a lot of people no. know or understand. No. So, has there been any uh, signs from the government, as in any kind of other solution, or what what is that is going to happen? Um, well, we've advocated quite strongly around. Um, the National Rental Affordability Scheme remaining in play. But it was a decision that was made some time ago that it was only for a 10 year duration, but there's been no affordable product that has come in as an alternative. Um, and we have to say that one of our um, tenants here in Gladstone um, has been incredible to, to support um, you know, advocacy around continuing NRAS, but it just hasn't resulted um, in a positive outcome. So we know that yeah, there's no turning back for the NRAS wind down and the best that we can do is what we're doing now, which is actually looking at more um, housing stock in community so that we can hold these people because we have their families contacting us, really concerned and stressed about what they will do with their ageing um, family member and needing to look at options outside of community. And when you've had people that have been in their community living and contributing to community for quite some time, there's nothing more stressful than thinking about having to relocate um, to somewhere away from your supports and your family. Mm. Yeah. If I may, I just wanted to ask you, we, um, not last year or the year before, I think, we, we put out an expression of interest to out there to get some sort of information from the market as to if anyone was interested in doing a housing or retirement type development. Um, did you get a chance to see it back then or? Well, we, at that particular point, that wouldn't have been, a, you know, we weren't in a position to actually come um, forward to look at a development and we are now. And, and I guess that's the thing for, for us is that we have moved into a more proactive space in relation to housing, in relation to developing options. Um, and I think that's been something that um, has been a really important strategic step for Anglicare, um, making sure that we can meet community need and align with our vision. Um, you know, we're also, you know, amongst, you know, with that step towards development, um, have, you know, really uh, amassed a, a fantastic team that work with us in relation to our development. So that enhances confidence when you're looking at um, you know, I guess moving into a space that is a difficult space to, um, you know, keep viable. So it's not only developing that, that we look at, it's actually the ongoing support and, um, uh, you know, maintenance of these buildings. So, you know, it's a, it's a long-term journey that we enter into when we start a project. So, as I said, not two years ago, but today, um, you know, we're looking at that precinct. Yeah. Uh, it's great. Obviously, there's when we have problems, we need to look at all different ways of trying yeah. to solve them, and they're not. There's a lot of different ways in which we can well, be creative and yeah. and pull out different resources. Uh, do you actually look at any other other um, passes of land or any other areas that every, you might every also every day, be? all day, we Adams <laughs> check, checking what options might be available, and that's why we've had conversations. I said with a number of the councils with state. Um, as well, uh, to identify what blocks might be available um, across our geographical area and, um, you know, approaching, you know, owners, um, you know, depending on what funding is available um, as to what we can make work. So, as I said, we're constantly looking at um, different options, but local councils were a natural, um, you know, you know, way for us to, to move and, and we know that some councils, are, you know, as I said, starting to really consider their role around housing and I think that's a really pr progressive, positive step. Um, yeah, no, I 100% agree with you. Yeah. I, and that, I stu the question was coming from um, if there was 
not just this area, but other areas that you might oh, like to look at? So. Oh, look, I think w when we met with the representatives, this was a parcel that, that just came, um, you know, mm. through the conversation as being a priority. Yeah. And so we thought, look, if that's where the focus and, and the will is, it's important for us to, you know, I guess, um, deliver on, on that. And so that's why Adam's shaped up, you know, a, a you know, an, an initial concept that might work for the needs of community here, so. Thank you. Yeah, so that's why that came about, yeah. yeah. Councillor Churchill and Councillor Brantwaite. Yeah, thanks, me, Matt. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for your time and your presentation and your efforts. Uh, mm -hmm. Having seen what Anglicare and been involved with Anglicare in many different ways in central Queensland over a long period of time, you, you've got a reputation of successful delivery of projects, programs, services, um, and best wishes. Um, I've got two questions in actual fact, because during the height of the LNGs, and we, we did a Gladstone Region Economic Development Strategy, and I don't know whether you've had uh, any time to have a look at that. That's readily available on our, on, it's the new one that's readily available on our website. But the previous one had identified that one of the high priorities uh, was aged care. And so leading to that particular point, uh, we lost a lot of our senior people yes. uh, during the height of that industry for many different reasons, probably because the market went up, et cetera, et cetera. But you make reference to the 55 social housing development. Uh, but one of the priorities was uh, the aged care, which was the, the tri-care, the high yes. care, you know the model. Yeah. So I'd like to just get an understanding of whether you're playing in that particular area in any way, shape or form. And the other question to it is that uh, you've mentioned uh, local government, or be it the three tiers of government yeah. as such, but I'd also like to get an understanding of whether you're nimble enough uh, and you actually have in your service delivery models partnerships with other service providers oh, rather exactly. than just Anglicare yeah. doing it on their own. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I'd love to know, and it doesn't make any reference in your presentation, but no. if you could give us some insight on whether you partner with other organisations that are uh, ha or have expertise in service delivery in our own backyard? Absolutely. I'll, I'll um, start with your first question, which was about aged care. Um, very, it's a very specific specialist um, model of, of care. Um, it has touch points, obviously, with, with medical models and, and clinical aspects. Um, Anglicare CQ does not offer that particular scope of service. Um, we are, as a, um, the board will meet with me in a couple of weeks to explore the option of aged care, but at this point, a, we are specialist child protection, you know, housing um, provider, you know, provider in community, and aged care is not within that um, scope of service delivery. There are a number of providers that actually do that, and, and we sort of, um, I guess, it, at this particular point, consider we stick to our knitting um, because the legislation and the requirements in aged care, as I said, are quite specific, and we know the challenges in that particular sector. So for, for us, our commitment and our growth strategy is around trying to make a difference in housing. Um, and so certainly when it comes to those um, commitments, we do link with other service providers. We can't do it all. Um, and that's the, the benefit um, of the partnerships that we have in community right across um, central Queensland. So um, definitely, um, you know, we, within any of the communities that we serve, those linkages are, in, are incredibly strong and you have, you know, network meetings and referral pathways depending on the needs of the, the tenants and, and the people that you work with. Um, Adam does have more to actually talk about in relation to um, the projects, but yeah, did you have more that you wanted to add about partnerships? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I can touch on the partnership um, one with you. Um, we are a, a founding member of a, um, a foundation called the Shelter Collective. Um, so there are um, a few few uh, partner members within that um, within that group. One of them is Rosebury Community Services, which is um, has has a pretty substantial operation down here in Gladstone. Uh, the other is Apprentice Trainees Queensland, and again, you know, they operate at both Rockhampton and Gladstone areas, and Billawilla, I, I believe, as well. So those three organisations, we come together and form the Shelter Collective, uh, along with a. Um, a couple of other just public members who had an interest in the housing crisis. Um, so what we're doing is basically looking to, um, I guess, generate interest from the private sector 
to help tackle this crisis. Um, a couple of the projects of our launch projects that we're getting off the ground, which are happening. So one of them uh, is a Rockhampton project. We had uh, 10 uh, cottages that were, haven't been used for 15 years. They'd been sitting there. They're in an aged care facility. Um, they're in desperate need they, uh, of renovations. So uh, we raised the money basically through community support, uh, in-kind support and the like um, to, I guess, renovate those cottages and get them back usable again. So the first one of those will be ready in about two weeks' time. Um, and there's another nine to follow that. Um, as one example, another project that we're looking at um, doing in Rosebury will we'll manage this one. It'll be um, a dignity bus. So it'll be a mobile dignity bus that'll operate. It'll have uh, dryers and washers in the back. Um, it's a full bus. We've had the bus donated through uh, Rotheries, um, a, a big local company. So they donated the bus. Uh, we're going to kit it out with homework stations and the like and pull out annexes so people can have a feed, wash their clothes and it'll have an ensuite shower behind it so they can have a shower and use those facilities too. So that'll be up and running we hope um, next year sometime. Uh, we're going to start work. We've had all the um, engineering and design work done on the bus. Um, it's now a matter of um, engaging that work at the back end of this year. I guess what I'm saying is the, um, the partnership that we have with the Shelter Collective, we wouldn't tackle a project like this alone. We'll do it with our partners that we've already got through the Shelter Collective. We've made some great connections um, with companies like NRG, JRT and, and those sort of things. So we've, we've got those partnerships in place. One, you know, it'll be a cost saving when we do get into the development phase using those uh, partners that are, are willing to support us and, and, and the like. Um, and two, you know, we've got that relationship with them and that sort of thing. So I guess that's an example of the partnerships we look at. We don't do it alone, definitely not. Yeah, <coughs> Thank you. I'll throw to Councillor Branthwaite, but then I, you've still got more of your presentation to go. Yeah, so we might go to that as well. <laughs> Actually, sorry. You're right. A, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, uh, my, my, my question is not really... It's more, it's more for, I suppose, looking at, um, I suppose, how big the problem is, you know, because you're dealing with, uh, as you said, a sector that is on disability pensions and... and whatever else, um, they can't afford the rents that are here now. And, and it's not just through the, um, the, the NASRAD system, or whatever they call it, the um, National yeah, yep. Mental Affordability, Affordability Scheme. But there's obviously people that are outside that because in the past with that system's also dealt with attraction of nurses and firemen and policemen to our region that can't afford the housing, so they, they fall into that, into that that sector as well. Um, but how, how big is the problem, just for interest's sake, how many people are you guys dealing with now, um, just in the Gladstone region, that are on this, this, this pathway of not having any, not being able to afford the, the homes? Yeah, um, it's, it's a really tough to gauge, like how many people, yeah. you, you know, really put a figure on it. Across our central Queensland services, we have eight to ten people present at our Anglicare offices per day, per day. Uh, looking for housing. Wow. So that's that's right across central Queensland, yeah. um, and that's just Anglicare. So to put a to put a figure on it, you know, is really difficult. We look at the social housing wait list as a, as a key indicator of how many people might be out there, and we know that's sitting around 650. So we know it's at least that big. We know that doesn't capture all of it with increased cost of living and, you know, the challenges that everybody's facing. There's people doing it tough that, you know, have never been to the Department of Housing. And I guess that's one thing. We, we're seeing new cohorts of people presenting at our door. It's working families now that are, can't sustain their housing, and we really have haven't had that before. Um, I guess that's a you know pretty yeah. big indicator of how bad the crisis has got. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, for those that are watching, it's uh, just really try to bring home the reality of the, of the perspective that you guys are, and and other agencies are dealing with. It's not just yourselves; it's yeah. the Salvos and, and all the other ones that help out our community. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. One more question from Councillor Cameron, then I'll no, ask you to <laughs> continue with your presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I could have waited, but anyway. No, that's right. No, no. Um, yeah, just, just a couple patient. of things uh, relative to the to the uh, rental situation. Um, those figures are probably correct that on the percentage increase over a period of time. <clears throat> what you've got to realise is that came from a very, very low base. 
where you know, we were the cheapest rental accommodation in the nation, mm -hmm. not just the state. Um, and the sad part about it is I, I got into the uh, rental market in about 2005 <clears throat> and the return I'm getting today is still not at 2005 levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and another problem Glanston's always had is the two-speed economy that we've got. Yeah. Whereas we've got people that have got high paid jobs in industry, uh, security, and all that sort of thing, supply and demand. And then you've got the other side of the cohort, which is your service people, your uh, tourism and hospitality, all those that don't enjoy that as well. So that's always been a big problem for us to address. The other thing is to do with your project there. I noticed that you're proposing 25 cottage style uh, buildings. Is that your normal? target is just standalone type buildings? N not necessarily. Um, so I can, uh, like for Livingston for example, the, the, the project that we've got in Yapoon, it's a 3,000 square metre block. We're looking at um, a three storey uh, dwelling on there holding 24 units for instance. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess we, we try to tailor whatever the, the proposal is to the to the cohort. So yeah. in this particular case, it was over 55s. So yeah. the, um, and what we found is um, a lot of them have small pets and stuff like that. So we, we pictured small cottages with small yards that are maintainable, not too big, yeah. um, each with their own individual lot. So they could have a small pet, mm -hmm. whether that's a duplex type arrangement sort of thing and they're butted together, you know, we could, we could work on that. But, you know, my first thought really come to that and I guess from here, you know, if we did get a, an offering of land and that was the particular cohort that we decided that we wanted to, to target, you know, we would go away and do some high-level designs and then come back to council and present those through mm. and, and, and just make sure that, we, you know, we're on the right path. And if there's, you know, we would target, you know, we, can, we tailor our builds, I guess, to target whatever cohort, yeah, sure. you know. What I looked at need. was that, to, to me, uh, that didn't look to be a economical use of the land. Uh, there's another project that's looking at the same sort of thing, but they're looking at uh, three-storey and duplex and all that sort of where we're going to get 90 plus residential units out of that block. Yeah, that to me would be a more sensible use of land. And I think it's looking at density versus quality, density versus quality of, of living and lifestyle as mm. well. And I think when we looked at Phillip Street precinct, I, I kind of wouldn't have pictured, you know, a couple of like levels of, of building really and um, looking at the cohort as well people that are able to um, or needing to have some flexibility in mobility um, concerns as mm -hmm. as time passes and they're needing to sort of have wheelie walkers and wheelchairs we, we felt as as low to the ground as possible and as easy to access service and um, you know and have, have more integrated living type approach out there where people can scoot over to the precinct and enjoy activities and supports over there. So, as I said, but that concept, initial concept that we've worked up thinking um, about the group, that can, we can be flexible around. Um, but as I said, we always want to make sure that we um, balance out um, quantity and quality and, mm. and um, you know, I guess that living, yeah. Yeah. In a housing crisis, every square metre is precious and should be used sensibly. Oh, and, and, we, and without out a doubt, we just want to be sure that it's a legacy that the community feels really happy about sure. and um, that people are happy to live in as well. Mm. Um, we've had, you know, fairly high density um, projects, um, you know, from, um, you know, years ago that we've partnered with the department around. Uh, there have been some legacy items that have been a little bit difficult to manage and, and particularly mixing tenancies. So mm. I do understand where you're coming from, but it's... You know, it's just trying to weigh up what you want to achieve and, and um, the cost and benefits, mm. isn't it? So that yeah. those 90 properties that you're managing now, they're rental properties, that you don't own them? And that's through the NRAS program yeah, and yeah. that's the one that we'll want. So they'll down. just they'll just go back into the, in, out of your hands but back into the yeah, They'll go in, back into the private rental market and go, and go yeah. back up to that, um, yeah. Yeah, that level of, of rent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. They're not Anglicare's homes? No, we, we NRAS is a separate. That, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. There is definitely examples in the Gladstone region of organisations, particularly not-for-profit, that use use the NRAS funding to build uh, new um, affordable housing for seniors. So um, that that might be picked up with the 15% increase in um, rent assistance. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to offset the, um, the wind-down of NRAS, but I guess time will tell. Yeah, absolutely. I'll hand back to you, Carol, to keep going. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fine. 
Um, yeah, no, I'll um, just talk a little bit more about the proposal and the, and the build that we had in mind for the site and um, a little bit about that. So uh, the, the block at um, Dave Bird's Drive that we've identified in the brief there, I guess how that come about was through discussions with council. They sort of identified that we want to do something on that, on that site. And as we've talked about, it, it was around keeping the ageing population um, in our community. So I guess we, we looked at the site, um, we looked at the cohort that we're trying to help sort of thing, and it, and the site does provide some challenges. Like um, a lot of the land around the precinct is, is sloping land, it has a lot of natural waterways that you've got to work through and the like. So that um, that's why we identified that's, uh, you know, that square, 7,000 square metre block that's um, across the road to the precinct. Um, we thought it was the most... Uh, I guess ideal sort of like uh, um, out of all the land that we could use for that particular cohort being the over 55s and the mobility issues and um, you know there's a zebra crossing right across to this precinct that we'd be able to utilise and, and stuff like that. We just thought that that would be the most suitable piece of the land. Um, as we mentioned you know our, our initial thoughts were to do 25 uh, one and two bedroom sort of cottage type designs on there. Um, yes, we could maximise the, the land usage um, in other ways, but we thought that the type of living environment that we were trying to create, um, that's what we had targeted, but um, we can be flexible around that and, and, and work with um, different cohorts and, and, and different levels of density as well. Um, our design, you know, we, we were looking at, I guess, featuring walking tracks and making it a really sort of uh, aged care living environment um, that anybody would be you know really happy to be to, to be living in um, we have identified a funding option um, to, to get the development off the line so there's a, a new release of what they called quick starts funding it's a state government initiative um, basically uh, having land security is a key component of that you won't uh, get a quick starts funding application approved unless you have that land security which is why we're here today um, but um, I guess with quick starts, 100% of the, the housing needs to be social housing. So again, you know, having a density of social housing beyond, you know, 25 and that you, you start looking at other complexities there as well. So um, I guess that, you know, the, the funding option and the, and the model that we've designed, I guess we kind of tied the two together. Um, so that quick starts funding will actually be released around June, July is the indicators that we've got from the state government this year. Um, so yeah, um, we believe that coming with them with a the land solution uh, will look be looked upon favourably um, and th that's what brought us here today. Um, as I mentioned, we don't do it alone. Um, we partner with industry experts. Um, so we use Design Tech and um, we will manage the design pro um, processes, we'll also look after the construction phase, but then we move into the operational phase. Um, and, um, you know, we really think that uh, the precinct has a lot, to, a lot of value add to a, um, to a development of this type, plus the Anglicare services that we'll be able to wrap around the oldies and, um, and the referral pathways and the like. Um, I think Carol touched on it, you know, we, we receive a modest return on, on rents, so we, we basically get 25% of a person's income as a rental return on, on these properties. Um, and so, the, you know, we, we receive rents that are under, under or around that $200 per week sort of thing, and from that we've got to fund all the ongoing maintenance costs, the insurances, the rates, etc. Um, so for, it's not, um, I guess, a money-making um, thing for Anglicare CQ, we do this because there's a need in the community and we need to fill it. Social housing is, is, is tough, um, but we've been doing it for a long time now, so you know we're, we're pretty experienced at it um, and we make it work. Um, that's probably about all I had there. We touched on some other bits through the questions, but if there's any other questions, or um, more than happy to answer those. I'll hand back to Carol anyway, and she can talk yeah. about the, the next steps from here. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't want to take too much more of your time because I do understand that we're probably over our time allocation, but um, I think the, the ask that we have of Council, we go into, I guess, the pointy end of things. Um, you know, in order to get this project off, off um, the ground, we quite literally um, will require um, commitment of land. We know that moves funding submissions into a higher degree of confidence um, and are more likely to get across the line. So 
what we are asking of Council um, is a letter of commitment um, to support funding applications that we submit and most specifically the gifting of two day burns drive the 7,000 square metre um, component at the front of that block. Um, I do say that that obviously comes with conditions, conditions to Anglicare CQ. So the gifting of that block would not be triggered um, until if and when we secured funding. Um, and certainly as um, Councillor Cameron had, has um, sort of talked about, being able to work together with Council in relation to considering any planning requirements, any change in target group, or um, design options are something that we, you know, we would um, expect that council will work um, shoulder to shoulder with us around. We want to be sure that um, whatever we um, deliver uh, with this land, with council, um, is something that actually meets community need and, and um, planning requirements. And as I said, is a really good legacy item for um, community. So we obviously leave the decision making in your capable hands around um, the land. Um, Adam and I are here to answer any questions to help inform that decision making. Um, ultimately, we hope that all elements of this project will come together and um, in the new year, in 2024, um, together we'll be able to deliver a social housing option for the Gladstone um, region. But as I said, we'll leave that um, to you to have a think about. Thank you. Um, look, that's fantastic and thank you for your presentation. We uh, currently have a, as you would be aware, no doubt, a um, uh, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with the Gladstone Central Committee on the Ageing, who have uh, a, a long history of providing um, Forwarding affordable housing for seniors in our community, particularly around Heritage Village, also operate the uh, Senior Citizen Centre. So um, we'd have to have a conversation with them about that because, Absolutely. as Councillor Muscat raised at the time, when we um, caught expressions of interest, they were the only um, organisation that put forward an expression of interest. They have since gone through a significant, um, uh, I guess, concept phase of what yes. could happen there, oh. and it's a volunteer organisation. So I certainly want to have that conversation with them. Um, yeah, no absolutely. doubt some of them will be watching online and have had no, that's, that's <laughs> and have heard this as well. Uh, when you say gifting of the land, is a peppercorn lease an option or are you looking at freehold? Oh. It is an option. It's really just making sure, oh, okay. <laughs> making sure that we're able to evidence a commitment of land yeah, um, okay. when we submit those um, yeah. funding submissions. And certainly we appreciate that you, that you already have an MOU in play. And mm. for Anglicare CQ, I mean, really our, our motivation is to be sure that housing can be um, provided in community. So whoever does that, yeah. um, you know, we don't mind much as long as it gets across the line for community. It's been my ultimate goal for Phillip Street as well. So yeah, absolutely. Um, it's fantastic to see what the Central Committee of Ageing are proposing there, but if um, they're not going to continue with that, we'd yeah. love to certainly have a conversation with Anglicare further about yeah. you securing funding and building exactly that. The yeah. precinct works when you have affordable social and um, ideally age um, and retirement options on one side of the road of Dave Burns Drive, former Deputy Mayor of our region, and um, and the precinct on the other side, which is only in stage one, by the way. That's going to get bigger and bigger as Absolutely. well. Anyway, councillors, further questions before we wrap up? Councilor just Special. some very brief ones. Uh, is your focus just on Phillip Street? Um, at this particular point, we haven't um, talked to council about um, any other um, blocks, but we are okay. certainly no, that's fine. Yeah, thank options. you for that, because obviously we'll get into some discussions later yes. on at a later time. Uh, and is it just about Gladstone? When you, when you use figures and stats, is it just about Gladstone or are you talking Gladstone and surrounds, Gladstone region, Boyne Tannum, Calliope? Oh, sorry, the figures that we presented today were um, Gladstone um, focused. Gladstone centric, Gladstone yes. central. And I think okay. probably the wait list would include the surrounds, your region, yeah. absolutely. And, and is, your priority, is your priority on a greenfield site? Because you did mention that you do some refurbishments of others. Um, so you wouldn't consider a, a, an older building? We could reserve. No, if we, it was yeah, in a, we'd be, we'd be open okay. and interested to have a look at oh, no. any Let's, sort of opportunities. Thank you. Appreciate that. That would fit within the funding yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 Councillor Hanson, then yeah, Councillor Yeah, that's Goodluck. the question I was going to ask as yes. well. You did mention you were uh, partnering with others to do the Rocky Cottages and whatever. Uh, and I know, I applaud what you're doing here, yeah, okay, straight you. away. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in partnering, but... Um, the facilities, some fa we have facilities here already in town that have previously been used as aged care, for aged care that are now shut down. Uh, would you be interested in those sorts of projects as well down the track? Yeah, look, we, we'd be interested to have a look at them because, yeah, the repurposing, you know, I think there's a lot of value in existing build buildings um, in the current building market. So, yeah, we'd be very keen to have a look at something like that. 
no doubt Thank hibiscus you. gardens is what you might be referring to which was aged care facility i know you said you're not moving into aged care but that's they certainly if blue care were interested could be um, refurbished potentially into affordable housing councillor good luck absolutely Anglicare, if Anglicare were interested. No, well, Blue Care own the building, oh, so we kind of need them to be on site. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. <In> Mayor. <laughs> yeah, no, we're with you now. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for um, the presentation. I met with um, George some time ago. I think you might have yes. referenced yes. earlier. Uh, George is a, uh, on a disability pension, and he's been a very passionate uh, advocate. He's on the NRAS scheme. Uh, lives in our region and he's been a passionate advocate not just for himself but for the other 90 uh, people in our region or families in some cases. Uh, another young mum um, with a couple of kids with, with disabilities and the reality for these people is that when NRAS winds down in 12 to 18 months um, that 25% rent subsidy runs out and there is no, there is no answer to that uh, at this current point in time and these people uh, these families are staring down the face of uh, their leases expiring, their rents going back up to market rate. Um, most of them on disability pensions or whatever the case may be. And as a, as a young family or as a, a person, uh, George and his, his um, support dog, Beagle, uh, Baxter the Beagle, sorry, um, staring down the face of being evicted from their home and being homeless. Um, so it really is... Um, you know, pretty scary. It must be a horrifying thought yeah. for those people. Um, so I just thought I'd take the time to mention the great work that George has done and um, certainly hoping that we can get some outcomes for, for all of those people. Uh, but it goes to the, to the work that you guys do um, and, and how important it is for people in our community that, that are doing it the toughest. And I uh, just wanted to say thank you for that okay. and thanks for your presentation. I, I think um, you we'll be happy to look at uh, something that we might be able to do. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Adam. Councillors, yep. oh, sorry, do we have another question, Councillor Muscat? Just uh, quickly on the shelter um, co uh, connect, no, what was it collective. called? Collective. collective yep. That's right. So do you have any local governments that are part of that collective or? Uh, we, we have um, a couple of uh, Rockhampton councillors that are yeah. part of the collective, but uh, in their private capacity yeah, okay. um, have joined me uh, as members and obviously declared it to their council and, yeah. uh, and their interest in, and the like. But um, outside of their private interest in it, um, yeah. no. Yeah, it's but there would be an opportunity for any local government to be part of the collective? Oh, definitely. And we set up, we set up the collective... Um, primarily focused to, to try and tackle the Rockhampton issue yeah. initially, but we thought uh, we wanted to set it up as a model that could be easily replicated in different locations. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea was always yep, uh, that this would expand into other regions mm -hmm. and um, you know, potentially uh, some of the members that have joined for the, for the Rockhampton one, you know, we sit across a lot of the local areas mm -hmm. across CQ. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, expansion. You said Rosebury and Community Services, Rosebury Community and also yeah. Services, Apprentices, Apprentices, Apprentices Training. Their Queensland. head offices are both here. Yeah, yeah. They are. I think you need a Gladstone Collective. <laughs> I, I, I think it's um, it's just that it uh, having an approach like that. Mm -hmm. Then you know we obviously have at least you know yourselves and another organisation that are also keen on trying to tackle this issue and with their expertise and their capacity. And we all have different expertise and capacities and different yeah. skills, etc. So, having a, I would love to try to have some sort of, you know, group conversations, because if this isn't the, the you know, the best uh, place, or if we have another group that is also undergoing certain plan, certain plans for these. Um, block of land, mm. there's no reason why we can't consider other areas, which might also be connected to the precinct, but at the end of the day, we're looking at um, at solving the housing a housing issue. Yep. So, yeah. and I really thank you for coming and well, wanting to partner with us because, well, I'm really excited and I think what you're doing is great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Mm. Here, thank you. Um, councillors, we have a uh, recommendation. Happy to move that we receive the report from Anglicare Central thank Queensland. You. Thank you, Councillor Churchill. Second, recommended. Councillor Hanson. Put the motion all in favour. Thank you, and Councillor Grady. Cheers. That's passed unanimously. Thank you. Um, and we'll move to the rest of the agenda now. Cheers. Thank you. All right, Councillors. Yes, no worries.
Um, councillors, the next item on the agenda is on our officers' reports. Our first officers report is G4.1, which is the 2022-2023 operational plan performance report for quarter three. And I'll hand over to the general manager of strategy and transformation, Carly Quinn, ably assisted by Kim Markson. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. So this report provides council with the third quarterly progress report for the 22-23 operational plan. Uh, at this point in the year, with only one quarter to go, it's great to see that all eight initiatives are well on track uh, to be delivered by the 30th of June, including the two extended initiatives from last year. There's been no risks to successful delivery of these items raised by the project team and no additional budget requests either or extensions of time. Three of our initiatives are warranted for some uh, commentary in the report via the exception reporting due to the tracking uh, of their initiatives being slightly behind what was projected at the beginning of the project plan, the milestones that were projected. However, they are all three now back on track. So the Works Delivery Program is one of them with the work um, being focused on making it easier to deliver affordable maintenance works programs. That had a shift in priorities over the last two quarters um, with us bringing forward the work on the maintenance strategy. That's now well in place and under in, in, in hand, which means the project is back on track. So um, we've been able to bring that work forward, include it in as additional work and still keep the program on track to deliver by the 30th of June. The sponsor of the community profiling initiatives has also endorsed a resource plan to ensure that that um, project is back on track and will be delivered by the 30th of June. And finally, the Backflow ID app and tag system. The report to talks about recruiting, but uh, there's been some further movement on that. The recruitment is well, well underway now and has progressed, which is good news for the team, as well as the rollout has commenced of that app. Um, so finally, um, it's a good position to be in, I guess, in quarter three, and it's probably the best position we've been in the last few years, um, at this point projecting all items to um, com be completed. The report also has some good news stories in there with the welcome of 15 new trainees uh, in the last quarter, $2.6 million worth of external funding secured, an update on the Brewer and Tree Recovery Project, um, Parks Week celebrations and improved safety for lone and remote workers. Um, so I thank the team for all their efforts in developing the report uh, and uh, the wider team in the business for all of the great success we've had in the last quarter and commend the report to you. Thank you, Carly. Question to the General Manager, please. Councillor Hanson. I have a, I have a few, Mr Mayor. Far away. Firstly, on the main report, uh, we're talking about works um, delivery. Um, I had this written down before I met with a group of... Um, property owners yesterday uh, uh, from the beef producing property owners um, and I'm asking when we were going to review our, our road hi hierarchy in this situation. It's not specifically in the works delivery but um, mm -hmm. I think that will come up again later on at some stage, Mr Mayor. Um, page 8 of 67, the waste... Um, the waste uh, final draft report on the waste will be finished before June, will it? When's it actually going to be yes, finished? Yes, that's correct. Is and that correct? Yes, that's correct. And the others are in the actual uh, operational plan as such, as the, in the attachment. Page, um, page 14 of 31. Sorry about that. I'm just catching up to where I am. How can we have a... Let's get to the page. Sorry about that, Councillor. An item at 52%. How can we have an item at, uh, you know, uh, that's showing green mm -hmm. when our goal is 70% and we're at 52%? <coughs> I know you're catching up and you've just said mm, that. Yeah. But that report is quite, is not, is not quite right as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the, re the report is accurate, but I guess that's that's an example of where we have had to we've brought forward the maintenance strategy. So it wasn't a piece of work that was ori originally anticipated to be completed. We brought that forward um, and had to include that into the plan. So if you look at the 
project plan technically, there are pieces that we didn't do in the last quarter that we would have done that we replaced with that maintenance strategy, but we now have plans in place on how we will do the rest of that work by the 30th of June. So um, it's, it's accurate, I think, um, for transparency. We want to make sure that we're not just shifting things in the plan and saying, oh, well, that's okay, you can shift whatever you like and you'll still be called on track. So we want to be transparent with it. But um, as, as sponsor of the project myself, I know that we have the plans in place to ensure the rest of the work's done. Now that, that the extra piece that we included is now complete. Okay. I sort of see, see what Councillor Hanson's saying though. Why is it not yellow? If the target's 70%, the actual progress is 52%. So it was yellow last quarter, and yeah. the reason it was yellow last quarter was because we didn't have the, the mitigation plan in place to to give a high level of confidence that it would be completed. So the green means it's on track to be delivered by the 30th of June. When it comes to reporting against our milestones, we're only at 52% of the milestones rather than where we wanted to be at this time of the year, which was 70%. But it is on track to be delivered by the 30th of June. Okay, look forward to the 100% by quarter four then? Yes, and I just sat here and said that, so. Yeah, you did. Yeah, no, you did say that. It's just <laughs> misleading when you see that. That yeah. I think it could be misleading to the general public if they're looking yeah. at that. That's yeah. all I'm saying. It is something we've grappled with along the way as to how do we, because these projects, particularly the programs of work rather than just the specific projects, are agile and do move and don't always align with the original milestones that were set when, when we adopted the operational plan items. And may I carry on, Mr. Mayor, just for a short time? Page 18 of 31. Why don't we have Why don't we have a, a scoring uh, system on delivering value with Capital Works? Is, is that Is that shown somewhere else? Is it? Sorry, I don't quite follow the question. Page 18, did you say? Yeah, it's working to conditions to deliver capital works it's under the whole heading of um, oh yeah of delivering value yeah so these, why don't we have a scoring system on attached to that that's not a piece of that's not a project that's just a success okay. story so it's just no a celebration story that one well that says that then um and uh, again in uh, page 20 or 31 it's the same thing resilient economy it's the same reason it's not it's not scoring yeah, that's correct. So the the first pages under each section are the initiative that we've yeah. um, committed to it to delivering. The other, the rest of the stories are celebration of success. Um, and the the final one, you, you were glad I've got to this point. Um, resilient economy. Um, I'm not sure what the culture is. The culture thing in that one. And they'll be under no, our people. Right. Yeah, our people, sorry, go to our people. Um, has the Pulse survey that's been mooted, has that been uh, analysed as yet? And if so, what is the result and when are we going to get that result? So the Pulse survey has be com been completed. The final data hasn't been um, released to the business to do the full analysis, but we have seen the high level results. I'm not sure if Tina wants to and that give in any indication. No. It'll be released when we get yeah. the final report. Yeah. report. Can't wait. Thank you. It is exciting. Thank you. Further questions, councillors? Councillor Muscat. Thank you. Uh, uh, mine is just a, um, a quick one around, it's actually around the same area, um, page 21. The GRC leader certificate program has been implemented within the business. I just wanted to check um, I guess it's not that many people, but is it kind of all throughout the business or is it specific areas of the business or what kind of uh, people are undertaking this, this um, training? Uh, so generally speaking, all of the culture programs are very widespread right across the business, but I did miss which particular one you were questioning. Sorry, the GRC Leader Certificate Program. Oh, yes, yes, sorry, so. yes, so the Leadership Program. There are a number of people from right across the business in various areas that are participating, so it's not just your traditional indoor workforce that are participating in that. Okay. Yeah. That was kind of what I wanted to just check and see if it was only available for type yeah. of middle management or no. if, okay, thank you. Okay, other questions, councillors? Okay, can I get a move for the officer's recommendation, please? 
Thank you, Councillor Branthwaite, and seconded Councillor Hanson. The motion, all in favour? Carried. Thank you, Councillor O'Grady. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Kim. The next item on the agenda is G4.2, which is our monthly financial statements for the period ending 30th of April 2023. And I'll hand over to the General Manager of Finance, Governance and Risk, Mark Holmes. Thank you, Mark. Morning, Mayor. Morning, Councillors. Uh, this is our uh, monthly financial statements through to the end of April. Uh, and what you'll see through this is probably a continuation of what we're projecting as a you know, very minor surplus there um, and just still continuing to see revenue track behind but pleasing to see some of those risk factors um, get shored up with respect to particularly our financial assistance grants and the like in terms of getting that balance of money coming through when they'll be released in May. So that was an announcement within the budget so whilst we did have some risk with some of those items we're seeing that being shored up so the cash flows for a lot of those revenue items will come through uh, in the May P. So we continue to track a little bit behind in an actual sense, uh, but we'll see them come through uh, as the, uh, essentially in, in May and June, particularly with respect to uh, those, those grant pieces. With respect to expenditure, very much uh, in line or just under that 83% pro rata amount uh, for, mo for most items, but still uh, probably seeing contractors spend a little bit behind there, particularly with respect to uh, we had the uh, big uplift there in our forecast to do some uh, recoverable work and that's probably tracking a little bit behind where we would have expected at this point. So that's why that one is a little bit behind. Uh, our capital works, uh, pleasing to say, has continued to forge, forge ahead and we've seen a, a strong uptick in our spend uh, during the April uh, month. So, so we're up now to just over $40 million in, in spend. So we're still looking at, at a forecast of just over the budget of $51.4 million. Uh, so whilst that was looking uh, probably two months ago quite like we'd be struggling to hit that uh, budget amount, we've, there's an increasing amount of confidence that we'll be able to hit that budget amount uh, come June. So some really uh, strong finish to year in that space. With respect to our outstanding rates, uh, They've continued to continue to fall, uh, and we now have an outstanding rate percentage of uh, just over four percent at four point eight two. So, compared to the same time last year, uh, that was at four point eight seven. So four point eight five. Sorry. So that was uh, pleasing to see. We're probably getting a little bit ahead of where we were at this time last year in that space. But happy to take any questions with respect to the report. Councillor Brown, mate. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just going back, Mark. Just going back to the um, the. The, the outstanding rates um, and for more for clarification anybody sort of looking at this report because it is able to be looked at the um, the last graph you've got there on page 19 of 67 with the residential rates and charges outstanding greater than 3% per sub suburb the actual the bar graph denotes outstanding in dollar value Yep, that's the outstanding dollar value, and the line graph is the number of properties. So we're looking at two and a half thousand, roughly, yep. two and a half thousand properties across our district that the rates haven't been received. Yeah, of of the of in that essentially in that's not necessarily all of them, but of that's of those that component, yes. Yeah. So, so we've got a number. Of, so as we work through, so this, that's going to be a point in time. So you'll note that we actually do have a number of properties that are on payment plans. And so they're included in that? They would be included in that. Oh, so right. So essentially the outstanding rate comes off yeah. as, as those payment plans are essentially you continue to be, you know, outworked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that would mean that, that your graph out there from for the the, for the outstanding rates on the, and year by year where it's down yeah. low, it's down to what, 4.02% yeah. is um, is indicative of, of um, would, it, would it include those ones that are on part payment? Yeah, so essentially, it, that essentially the four point oh two. That's essentially that's where we are right now. Yeah. So, so, so if people have still have time to go on those payment plans, yeah, that's not taken into account. It's basically what they've paid to date. Right. Cool. So if they well, still have outstanding amounts, that's yeah. still that's still considered as outstanding. Yeah. For the last the last few times I've been looking at these, I've been trying to draw the dots together and it's it's nice to have that explained. What the, the difference there probably from an operational sense for us is that you know, we, you know, we and certainly we encourage our rate payers to enter into a payment plan Yeah, is more in our debt collection activity. So yeah. certainly we just, uh, if people are on payment plans then we just make sure we maintain contact and 
continue to outwork that and we don't take any debt. Do you have any idea of how many are on payment plans, like in a percentage oh, wise? Yes, I think there's around about, it's in the report there, just under th over 1,300 people, 1,311 properties. Yeah. For residential and there's 42 commercial properties. Yeah, it's it's, it's certainly a, a way I know, I know Mr Mayor, you're, you're part of that scheme, is that right? <coughs> Were you on a payment? Oh, you oh, years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for letting us know that. <laughs> oh, no, well, it's just, yeah. it's more the reality check of, of yeah. today's thing. You know, mm. we're talking, before we were talking about people struggling mm. to pay rents and that. Mm. And there's, a, there's obviously a lot of people in our district that mm. do struggle to pay pay their rates, you know. Yeah. It's, mm. In essence, it's a property tax, but it, it helps make our community what it is, mm. you know. Um, but it's a way of making that, that, that impact a lot less. That's what the point that I'm trying to get to. The way I did it was, um, for many years, um, was paid in, so I never got the 10% discount. I didn't get that for probably 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Uh, but paid a little bit extra until I finally got in front. And now I get the, the 10%. By the time my rates are due, now I'll be able to, I'll be in front. Yeah. So that's what lots of people are doing. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to see that if you, if you slowly put a little bit more each month, yeah. um, you so it's actually eventually get in front. It yeah. lessens that impact and that shock value. Mm. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. I, I took yeah, 10 or 15 years before I finally received a discount from council. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. So we're actually in the peculiar position now as we progress through the financial year, particularly once you get to March, April, May, where our actual prepayment amount is actually greater than our outstanding rates. Mm. Yeah. So you'll, you'll note there in the report that we've essentially got $9.7 million in prepayments, whereas we've only got $7.9 million in outstanding. So sure. where we, that's where, and that's essentially when those, so that that's those people who've got ahead and been paying ahead on that monthly basis. So when the rates are levied, they've essentially paid off again for the following financial year. Yeah. And my just my last comment is that it's nice to see the capital works program climbing up in a really steep rate to yep. be at that goal. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Brentwright. Councillor Churchill. Yeah, thanks for that, Mayor Matt. If it's confession time, yes, we're on a prepayment scheme, and uh, and it's a great initiative, and it works well. And I and I and I encourage others to actively participate on that. But that's not yeah. my question. Uh, anyway, I've confessed that publicly. Um, I wanted to refer to page eleven, which is the Dryden and Drive Water Main relocation, Dawson Highway, and hopefully there's a simple answer to this. Is that I was of the belief that the, that particular relocation project is now completed. Your last reference says significant expenditure and claims are expected in the last quarter of the year. Uh, is In accounting terms, is that the last quarter of this financial year? Yes. Yeah, but not the last quarter of the year, of this year, 2023. No, no, You're talking so, yeah. so this is a, with respect May, to June. Correct. Okay, all right. So thus, when we get to the 30th of June, or be at the 1st of July, there will be no significant expenditure and claims anticipated or expected. Yeah, we expect, you know, obviously this work is still is still ongoing, and um, so we expect that we we will be claiming, you know, that essentially right up to June, uh, whatever amounts we have spent in that space. Yeah, no, great. No, it's a very it's a comprehensive report. It's just that in other parts of the report it refers to the 2022-2023 financial year. It just said in the last quarter of the year. So, I, anyway, thank you for that. That's clarified it. Thank you, Councillor Cheshire. Fantastic project in Calliope. Can't wait till it's finished. Any further questions for our general manager, please? No. Can I get a mover for the officer's recommendation? Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry, Councillor Trevor. Oh, Mark, okay, you mentioned that um, at this stage it looks as though we will be delivering a minor surplus uh, without holding you to any figures, given that things can go wrong at any time uh, and probably will. Um, what, what is that current amount by way of minor surplus yeah, approximately? We're talking uh, half a million dollars. Half yeah, a million dollars. Half a million dollars. Okay. Okay. In our $225 million budget, yeah, so, half, so it's half a million dollars. So it's not, it's not much marginal, margin of error in that, so. No, yeah. but if we had a sudden and extra, extraordinary emergency, we'd be right. Yeah, so I, in terms of, and it depends on the size and scale of, of that emergency. So we, from a cash position, we maintain good ability to essentially fund any of those you know, unforeseen events. Yeah. Yeah, but not saying, I'm, who knows what impact that might have on our overall financial position because that might have a, a one-off negative impact. But certainly we, we actually, 
would it may be a negative operating position, but we certainly have the ability to fund those because we have a good cash position at the moment. And I noticed that uh, our overtime expenses uh, to date are approximately 1.4 million. Uh, is that it because of sudden and extraordinary emergency, or is that because we can't fill uh, relevant positions uh, that we'd like to fill? Uh, but can't due to the fact that we have a skill shortage. I think it's actually probably a combination of both uh, those factors. Yeah. Um, I noticed that the forecast has been updated to reflect 6.8 million in additional contractor costs, and of this amount, 4.6 million relates to Dawson Highway Drive and Drive intersection upgrade. I can't remember. Um, the circumstances surrounding that. Could could you please let me know why um, the $4.6 million uh, of contractor costs uh, has uh, been incurred? Yep, so essentially, additional yeah. Payment? Yeah. so essentially we've got an overall, we've got essentially a main roads recoverable works contract yep. uh, of opportunity that was provided to us. So essentially what we're expecting is when we were referring to those claims previously under recoverable works, yep. yeah, we're expecting to make, if we, as we spend that contract the money, we should be able to claim that back from main roads underneath that contract arrangement. Good. Um, and uh, I also noticed in the material presented that um, in relation to waste disposal and tipping see, uh, fees, uh, costs are currently exceeding the pro rata forecast with higher than anticipated tipping fees in the stormwater, sewage and waste areas. Uh, is it true to say that we're still running our, um, uh, our waste services uh, not cost neutral? That is to say, uh, are we not recovering the full amount of the cost that it's costing us to run our waste services, run our waste services in our region? Yep, so our waste services are a commercial business, so that yep. and it has two components of that. Essentially, it's our landfill yep. and essentially transfer station services, and then essentially we've got our truck. So, yes. there's, so, so those that, you know, so that, but our landfill is certainly a lot closer to uh, breaking even and getting a small return, but certainly uh, we've the increased CPI costs with respect to the truck have, have put some pressures in that space, so that's not at, not at uh, break even at the moment. That's great, thanks, Mike. Thank you. We've got Councillor Goodluck, then Councillor Cameron. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Uh, my question mark was just around the overtime expenses. I, I can't find in the statement of income and expenditure or, or the attachments where it's referenced specifically, so it's obviously hidden in another line yeah. item. What yeah. line item might So it's part, of your, it's part of your employee benefits line item? In the employee benefits, and yeah. does that come under... Um, sorry, where am I? Yep, yeah, I'm just trying to find the line item. Is that under um, contractors? It can't be under... Yep, yeah, so it's in your, in your income statement. It should be part of your first line there in your income statement. Okay, I might get you to run me yep. through that shortly. Sure. Um, but just just clarifying, what was it? What was it revised from? Was what I was trying to find. So it's gone up to one point four. What was that forecast or, or budgeted to be initially? So from from memory, I'll probably have to take it on notice to get back to you to get the exact amount. But it certainly has been a significant increase in that space. So we, it was under a million dollars. Um, yeah. So certainly there, uh, but it certainly has been that increase. And yeah, as we've seen, we've had those some of those staff shortages in some areas and which yeah. means we have had to uh, you know, essentially cover that with overtime and then others, other resources. No, that's all right. I, and Councillor Trevor, you, you answered the other part of my question. I was just trying to find where, you know, what it was revised from, and I couldn't find it in the financial statements, but you, you can uh, direct me to that shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cameron. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, just a, an observation. I think overall the fact that we're going to still have a uh, small surplus, somewhat amazing. And I largely too, I've tracked this th through that when I, you look at your budget as opposed to forecast with your revenue, we've picked up 16.2 million yep. along the way. So it's a great well, effort, really, really good report. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Okay.
No more questions? Going once? Can I have a mover for the officer's recommendation? Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Seconded, Councillor Trevor. Sorry, Councillor O'Grady, I'll get you next time, I promise. All in favour? Carried. Okay, we'll do a couple more and then we'll break for morning tea if we can. Uh, we'll see how we go. G4.3 is a tender for um, RPQS 118-23 provision of ICT professional services. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors. This item is a consideration of a uh, essentially a register of pre-qualified suppliers that we've gone out to the market for for our ICT professional services. Essentially, we've uh, gone out and sought expressions of interest to the market for essentially two, both sides of our uh, ICT services and essentially system support. So essentially we're looking, in the one hand, we're looking at our networking type support, so that the real, essentially the technology, the backbone to our systems, and also then looking at for how we support our software and, and the enhancement of, of, of those. So we've got, gone out to the market. We did receive uh, essentially 20 submissions. There is one that essentially we have essentially, uh, upon review, probably doesn't, isn't fit for purpose uh, for this report, but we are recommending uh, 19 for inclusion on that register of pre-qualified suppliers. Happy, happy to move the officer's recommendation, uh, Mayor Matt. Thank you, Councillor Churchill. Count seconder, please. Councillor Muscat. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, before I put the motion, Councillor O'Grady has a question. Yeah, just a question. Um, so I see that we have some locals there. Are they, um, some of the organisations obviously aren't in our region, so we can't use them? Um, if we put them on a pre-qualified list, they'll be able to be used. Yep. But there is a local um, waiting towards um, yep, preference so towards local in a waiting. Can't, absolutely, it's uh, part of part of that. So look, I'm probably unaware of it. That there is, I know there is some uh, locals as part of that. When we've got a, our register of pre-qualified suppliers, that would be our first point of call. If there are others that come available, it doesn't preclude us from uh, essentially engaging those. It just is a slightly different process from a procurement perspective. Okay. Thank you, Mark. And Matt. Yep. So when the procurement team go through them, they obviously, yep. where appropriate and possible, yep. use the locals first, but then they have other options. I'd, I'd like Councillor Trevor to be able to give us a rundown of what each of these companies does, if that's possible. <laughs> I'm surprised uh, my name wasn't on the list, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We have a mover in. Um, Councillor Churchill, did you move that? Yes, thank you. And seconded Councillor uh, Muscat. I'm going to put the motion now. All in favour? That's, oh, pause that. Nilly, uh, Councillor Goodluck has a question. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Sorry, you nearly missed me. I don't know how. I was usually just very sitting there quietly waiting for you to look over this way. Um, Mark, just um, is it that we would seek the services of, of each of these um, proponents at, at different times, or is it just a, a swathe of people in case... I know you mentioned in the report, you know, it's about risk management and having to... I'm just curious more so, do we... We will engage the services of each of these providers or it's just... It depends what happens. It's probably more... It more falls into that we may yep. engage the services. So essentially, you know, supplementing our, our resources, if, you know, if we have some of those staff shortages we're talking about. You know, some of these are quite technical areas uh, and so, so sometimes we need that expertise on hand. Uh, through these um, suppliers to just to help us get across the line. And because a number of them, um, I, I don't, I'd need Councillor Trevor to explain to me what they do as well, yep. but um, a yep. number of them seem to offer similar services. So is it, is that just so that in, in case we can't get yep. one one proponent, we can access the services of someone else? Is that how we... Yeah, there is different data. There, and there, there certainly is probably certainly multiple skill sets there, but also, also probably multiple suppliers that probably could provide the same service. But, it's a, yeah, but it, like, you yeah, know, when we go to the market for different things, they will depend when we go as to who's available at the time, uh, whether they can provide that service or after. This just, give, this just gives us the avenue to appoint one or the other of those. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, no more questions? I'll take three. Councillor Churchill moves. Councillor Muscat second. Putting the motion all in favour. This time is carried. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we can maybe get to the revenue policy. So G4.4, revenue policy 2022-2023. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Mr Mayor. This is the uh, first of the policies that essentially are the lead up to your 23-24 budget. 
Uh, so your revenue policy is required to be adopted each and every year ahead of budget and essentially, essentially sets those overarching principles by which we uh, look at raising revenue for the, uh, for the council to fund its operation uh, for, the, uh, for the budget upcoming. Mm -hmm. So there isn't any significant changes proposed as part of this uh, revenue policy and is uh, presented for your consideration. Very important document. Um, okay, thank you, Councillor Trevor. Seconded, Councillor Hanson. Um, always nervous when you repeal a revenue policy and replace a new one, but it seems just a word change. So, um, I think that's fine. No further questions for our general manager of finance, Mark. This is on you. This one. <laughs> All in favour? Motion is carried, and we will break for morning tea. Sign up to Council's Disaster and Weather Event Warning System. Receive alerts about emergency news, severe weather events and other public safety alerts via SMS or email. Registering to the Disaster Messaging System is free. To register, visit Gladstone Regional Council's Region Watch website and click on the Register for Warnings button. Get ready Gladstone. Take the steps to protect what's most important to you. Let's be better prepared and protected for emergencies and disasters.
Gladstone Regional Council are committed to fostering a proud, involved and engaged community. The Gladstone Regional Council Community Investment Program provides financial support to local community initiatives, projects and events which promote community connections, regional enhancements, community celebrations and community education. For more information on the Community Investment Program, visit gladstone.qld.gov.au. Gladstone Regional Council. Connect. Innovate. Diversify. Illegal dumping and littering is a concern across the Gladstone region, with over 134 offences in the last 18 months. Our region is beautiful, but there are a few bad apples that ruin it for the rest of us, and they need to clean up their act. Commonly found items at illegal dumping sites across the region include car bodies and batteries, mattresses, tyres, white goods and furniture, and green waste. These items can be disposed of at any of the region's waste transfer stations, some of them even for free. Illegal dumping and littering pollutes our environment, harms plants and animals and detracts from the enjoyment of our public spaces. It can lead to stormwater and ocean pollution with large amounts of plastic, sugar sachets and cigarette butts caught in stormwater traps and grates. It's cheaper for everyone to dispose of waste correctly. Illegal dumping and littering cost our ratepayers thousands of dollars each year in waste management and cleanup. It's also costly for our dumper with penalties of up to $10,000. We can all work together to keep our region beautiful and dispose of waste responsibly by placing rubbish in the bins or even holding onto the rubbish until you're near a suitable bin and using our local waste facilities. Don't be part of the problem of pollution 
We want you to be a part of the solution. From towns to the bush, illegal dumping and littering is everybody's responsibility. Protect our public spaces and natural environment by doing the right thing for today and tomorrow. If you see illegal dumping, dive in a dumper. See it, report it, stop, stop it. it. Sign up to Council's disaster and weather event warning system. Receive alerts about emergency news, severe weather events and other public safety alerts via SMS or email. Registering to the disaster messaging system is free. To register, visit Gladstone Regional Council's Region Watch website and click on the Register for Warnings button. Get ready Gladstone. Take the steps to protect what's most important to you. Let's be better prepared and protected for emergencies and disasters.
Gladstone Regional Council are committed to fostering a proud, involved and engaged community. The Gladstone Regional Council Community Investment Program provides financial support to local community initiatives, projects and events which promote community connections, regional enhancements, community celebrations and community education. For more information on the Community Investment Program, visit gladstone.qld.gov.au. Gladstone Regional Council. Connect. Innovate. Diversify. Illegal dumping and littering is a concern across the Gladstone region, with over 134 offences in the last 18 months. Our region is beautiful, but there are a few bad apples that ruin it for the rest of us, and they need to clean up their act. Commonly found items at illegal dumping sites across the region include car bodies and batteries, mattresses, tyres, white goods and furniture, 
and green waste. These items can be disposed of at any of the region's waste transfer stations, some of them even for free. Illegal dumping and littering pollutes our environment, harms plants and animals and detracts from the enjoyment of our public spaces. It can lead to stormwater and ocean pollution with large amounts of plastic, sugar sachets and cigarette butts caught in stormwater traps and grates. It's cheaper for everyone to dispose of waste correctly. Illegal dumping and littering cost our ratepayers thousands of dollars each year in waste management and cleanup. It's also costly for our dumper with penalties of up to $10,000. We can all work together to keep our region beautiful and dispose of waste responsibly by placing rubbish in the bins or even holding onto the rubbish until you're near a suitable bin and using our local waste facilities. Don't be part of the problem of pollution. We want you to be a part of the solution. From towns to the bush, illegal dumping and littering is everybody's responsibility. Protect our public spaces and natural environment by doing the right thing for today and tomorrow. If you see illegal dumping, dive in a dumper. See it, report it, stop it. Sign up to Council's Disaster and Weather Event Warning System. Receive alerts about emergency news, severe weather events and other public safety alerts via SMS or email. Registering to the Disaster Messaging System is free. To register, visit Gladstone Regional Council's Region Watch website and click on the Register for Warnings button. Get ready, Gladstone. Take the steps to protect what's most important to you. Let's be better prepared and protected for emergencies and disasters.
Gladstone Regional Council are committed to fostering a proud, involved and engaged community. The Gladstone Regional Council Community Investment Program provides financial support to local community initiatives, projects and events which promote community connections, regional enhancements, community celebrations and community education. For more information on the Community Investment Program, visit gladstone.qld.gov.au. Gladstone Regional Council. Connect. Innovate. Diversify. Well, thank you, councillors. Thank you, officers. We um, now move to the next item on the, on the agenda, which is G 4.5, the review of our gates and grids policy. And I'll hand over to our general manager of uh, says finance, covenants and risk, Mark Holmes. But that's not Mark Holmes. That's no, Mark Francis, and manager of strategic asset performance. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mayor. Morning, councillors. Um, You'll be aware that in 2020 you adopted our gates and grids policy. Um, this is a review of that policy. You'll also be aware that there's been some challenges in practically outworking um, the policy in an operational sense. Um, we also foresee future um, challenges as other grids reach the end of their life. What we've done um, here is present two options. One is for you to maintain the current policy and we will outwork that to the best of our ability. Or two, a slight amendment to the policy which um, reintroduces a permit system for existing gates and grids that will not be transferred to council under the existing policy. Um, and this is in response to um, some community concerns as well as discussions with yourselves um, in previous briefings. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark. Questions to the general manager, please. Councillor, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Just assuming. No, the, uh, I don't have any questions. Thanks, Mark. I think this is a good um, balanced um, option that you've come back with, and um, I hope that this will uh, give a way forward for all the landholders, many of which who have who have not to this up to this point in time signed over um, ownership of the grids to council. Um, so if that, uh, if they wish to remain um, in that situation, they've got the option to go back under the permit system. Um, and this is also a good outcome for our community so that we can make sure that uh, we've got all those liabilities covered uh, in the broad scheme of things. So I'm, I'm happy to support the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to you and the team for the work that you put into this uh, over a period of time. Thank you. Our colleagues in governance have done a, a lot of work here as well. I haven't got a movie yet, but I was just seeing if there's any more questions. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> just going on to, on the uh, conditions here, one of them is to maintain that the uh, grid owner uh, will maintain a public liability insurance policy for the grade or the grid. What, wasn't that a part of the issue in the first place that they couldn't get public liability insurance? 
some people are telling us that they were struggling to do that. Economically, yeah. Yeah, so during the, the consultation that was undertaken when we made the major policy change, there was some indications from landholders, not all of them, but some, to say that it was difficult for them to obtain affordable public liability insurance. Um, but under the proposed um, amendments to the policy, it will mean that landholders can go and get the insurance and go on the permit system, alternatively, they can go through the process to transfer ownership to council, whereas council will take on full um, responsibility for the maintenance and insurance of those grids. So there is a two-phase approach for landholders. Okay, so um, once there is a permit in place, their ability to get insurance is enhanced, is that the story? Um, no, once the per if they would make their own inquiries as to whether or not they can obtain insurance. Um, provided they can obtain insurance and satisfy the conditions of the permit, then we would issue a permit. And I, I don't think it was necessarily an inability to obtain insurance, it was the fact that it was uneconomic for them to do so. But when compared to the cost of a replacement grid, it puts it in stark relief. And many councillors do operate the permit system, including Department of Transport and Main Roads, and insurance is always a requirement there. Okay. My other question, what is the cost of a permit? Uh, legally, um, when we issue a permit, it has to be on a recovery of cost basis for the fee. Um, so we're yet to determine that as to what it, what it would sit at. But I believe prior to us um, taking away the permit system the first time round, it was, I'm looking at Vicky. $200 per annum. Yeah, so we would revisit the cost, but yeah. it wouldn't be a punitive um, approach. Okay. So just a quick question. This is classed as a, a minor adjustment to the um, process, to the policy only. That's, and it doesn't have to go out to public consultation. That's the reason why. Well, we are reintroducing the permit system, but we're, keep, we're maintaining our current um, yeah, policy that. position. So that. that's, that's the basis okay. for it. All right, thank you. We will be engaging the community since it involves a change to our local law. So there will be community consultation in relation to those changes. Yeah, that's good. That's, but not in yeah. the policy. Yeah. That's got to be known that we are going to. Yep. Thank you. Any, okay, I have a mover in Councillor Goodluck and a second in Councillor Churchill. Very sensible outcome, thank you. Councillor Grady, did you have a question online or are you just supporting the recommendation? No, I was going to second it, Mr Mayor, thank so you. it seems you've been forgetting to look on the screen. I look, so, what, but that's okay. I look up to see if you're in, in supporting, but I forget to get you to second it. It's too very good. Thank you, Councillor Trevor. So we're essentially going back to where we were in the first place. Well, no. 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 Where, no. They're, they're, one option and then there's another. So either the status quo or uh, the new option, which is for people uh, to be able to have a permit, get their own public liability insurance as well. So yeah. so, can so do both. Go, so, so we're going back to where we were before we introduced the new policy that's currently in existence at this very point in time. No, the, the no. old policy was permit system only. Yeah. So we've now got, we then went to council owns all the grids. Uh, we've had issues with uptake on that yep. um, and part of that is because I don't even uh, as Councillor Cameron mentioned there was some concerns raised by some stakeholders around the, the prohibitive cost of insurance for public liability on the grids. Uh, I don't think any landholder was expecting that um, the cost to replace a grid at uh, $26,000 uh, for Council to do that work and that's the reality that's the cost of replacement and installation. Um, when the landholders can do it themselves for probably about $12,000 and some uh, manual labour, which they're generally not too afraid of. Um, so I would suggest that the cost of insurance might no longer be prohibitive. So, so Councillor Trevor, this is a hybrid system. So it's what we had be what we have now plus what we had before, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But we're, we're going to allow the land 
owners to construct their own grids on council-owned property? Only to only to a standard. A set standard. We now have a set standard yes, for grids. Yes, that's the Capricornia Municipal that's Development yes, Guidelines. That's correct. Yeah, and and so so if they build that to that standard, we're satisfied uh, that that is fine, even though the grid is on our land. Yes, that's correct. Okay. If they have a permit. Subject to permit. <laughs> if they have a permit, of course. Yes, and also um, we're not expecting. Um, every grid to be replaced with a grid of that standard. The permit system will allow them to effect repairs subject to necessary works and roads permits. So our risk appetite as the owner of the grid is when it reaches its end of life with three structural failures, we would replace it with the CMDG standard grid. Yep. But a landowner on a permit system will be able to maintain the grid and repair it. Right. And indemnify council through the the, the permit system and the, the liability insurance. Yes. Very good. Thank you. I go back to the mover of Councillor Goodluck, second of what I think, Councillor Churchill. That's right. Uh, no further questions. I put the motion all in favour. Motion's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, all right. Councillors, the next item on the agenda is G4.6. It's our community investment program funding applications. I'll hand over to the general manager of community development and events, uh, Kylie Lee, who is ably supported by a whole team. Thank you. Ah, uh, no. What we're going to do? Um, actually, before it, Kylie presents the report. Uh, we're going to split the items as per the um, conflicts of interest, but it is really, council is really difficult. Um, considering I have to split this one, two, three, four, five times. Um, the alternative option is for all the councillors with conflicts to leave for the entire duration, um, and the remaining councillors without conflicts can deal with it all. Um, my initial preference was to split them so everyone has um, the ability involved in everything else, but this is going to make this very confusing. Um, Lisa, can I get some thoughts for you before I put a procedure motion? Yes, it's entirely at um, council's council's discretion as to how you'd like to manage it. There, 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 uh, there is the possibility that um, there could be some conversation around um, projects that aren't proposed to be funded. It could get quite complicated in terms of just managing who has a conflict. And um, there is one view that if you're conflicted with with one of the applications then you may be conflicted with all because if if reducing someone else's funding could assist one that you um, you are um, conflicted with to, not not saying that anyone would do that but there is a potential for that to be seen that way it's going to be very tricky to manage but we'll absolutely support councillors through that process if you'd like to split all of the items um, but it's totally at your discretion in terms of if you'd like a procedural motion to split hmm. um, for the councillors that don't have a conflict before I put a procedural motion um, I guess if I put it, then it'll be supported only, voted on only by the councillors with no conflict. Thank you, Tanya. Yes, I agree. So if I put a procedural motion to split and the five, I don't have a majority, which will be three, then we won't be splitting it. Okay, Councillor O'Grady, you had a question. Yeah, it just dawned on me, <laughs> dawned on me that I'm actually a life member of Calliope Radio Association. But I don't believe I have a, um, any conflict. Raised it. I'll have to put the vote. No, no. Good. Okay. Thank you. No, I'm not going to do. No, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to just be. No. Before you move your procedural motion, yeah. trying to anticipate, are you intending to, as a procedural motion, split all eight individually? No, I was going to split four point six. Wouldn't that be easier? Well, I know, because then I'm going to have a lot of... I was going to split 4.6 uh, into Gadagil, Gladstone Ports Corporation, Gladstone Men's Shed, Gladstone Cart Club, YMCA Bundaberg, Women's Health Centre, Calliope Rodeo, and Collective Action Social Impact in one item, where no one has a conflict, and then separated by then BTABC, not-for-profit house, GAPDL and GAPDL. That was what I was thinking of doing. I would put that, to be fair, um, so that we can have as many councillors in the room for the decision. Hopefully I'll get a second and then we'll take a vote on it and um, of the five councillors that are able to vote. 
So, councillors, I think you heard my procedural motion to split that item into one, two, three, four, five. I will move that way. Seconded, Councillor O'Grady. Conversation or questions from councillors uh, Churchill, Trevor, and Cameron. And me. Isn't Councillor Churchill? You have a conflict here as well, don't you? No, he, no. we voted he could stay in the room, ah, which was for the next too. item, not this one. No, not this one. Any questions you'd like to ask of Tanya, Lisa, myself, or Kylie? <laughs> so no? this, this schedule that was being given us, this is the proposed split, is it? Yeah. And if we don't split it, then all four councillors will be leaving the room and the five of us will be making the decision. So is it, a, is it a four-way split, Mayor? Is that, is that what you're proposing to do? We'll talk about page one first, and then page two, then page three, and then page four. That's correct. Five. Five, Five. Oh, yeah. sorry, I've I did the same last thing. Last page was yeah. stuck together. So, yeah. so one, two, three, four, five. So yeah. we speak to the five of those items separately, although the first item a number of them. Yeah, what I would do is um, for the first discussion would be with all councillors in the room for all items that have either recommended or not recommended um, where there is no conflict and then we would move uh, to the next item where we would discuss BTABC, Councillor Goodluck would leave the room. Mm -hmm. Then we would move to 4.6, we'd discuss, it's not proper house, Councillor Hanson would leave the room, Councillor Goodluck would return. Uh, we would then go to 4.6 and GAPDL for event equipment, Councillor Muscat would leave the room for event no oh councillor branthwaite leaves the room sorry everybody else returns then 4.6 uh communities for children councillor muscat would leave the room feel free sorry yeah councillor hansen question I'm oh no, oh, sorry i don't know that you can we're discussing um splitting the items of the councillors that uh, have no conflict it's directly in in line with the okay the discussion of splitting the motions yeah. Yeah. i am offended by the notion that if we have a conflict, we have to go out of the room for every item because we uh, may try to influence the money, money from, that we're conflicted with into another item. I'm just offended by that. I don't think that any of us would ever do that. Mr Mayor, maybe if I could clarify, and it wasn't my intention, there have been times before where they've, we've had funding programs with a number of applicants not recommended for any funding, and Council has decided to provide partial or a percentage funding to every applicant to ensure that everyone received funding. So it wasn't my intent that, that there would be that bias towards your own organisation. Apologies for my clumsy wording. It was Apologies If there accepted. was a conversation or discussion in that light, then everyone with a conflict would could be conflicted in that situation. So if that's not something that's intended to, to occur in the conversation, but maybe if it does come up, that's just something to be conscious of. <laughs> it has been flagged that there may be some consideration of a different so approach. So just for an example, Lisa, uh, applying that principle, if in relation to page one, if I was to uh, plead for mercy in relation to for example, only YMCA, Bundaberg, Gladstone and beyond, and everyone's here, and I'm successful in my uh, plea for mercy, um, then there is an issue in relation to potential conflict. I don't believe that specific example would provide a conflict because no one has a conflict with that organisation and you're talking yes. just about that specific organisation. It would be more if you were looking at taking uh, uh, an overall approach to say you'd like every applicant funded to at least 80% of what they'd requested and um, to, to, be, to ensure that everyone could fulfil their projects, if that makes sense. So if you're looking at a blanket approach to all of the applicants, but if you were um, arguing for a specific applicant that no one else had a conflict with, I don't believe that would be a situation of difficulty. But the the only think. issue where I see it could come into a conflict is that we are dealing with a discrete amount of funding. So um, wanting to apply more funding to one party may mean that we need to take away the funding to another. 
or we have to make a resolution to provide additional funding to that program. So it does become quite complex and I often recommend with our officers on the panel if they have a conflict in, in assessing one application, they have a conflict in assessing all of them because of they could influence um, you know, the result of another to better their, their Can conflict. Can I ask a question then on that? Did that yeah. happen? Because there was at least one officer that had a conflict in an item in the confidential attachment without going into it. Did they participate in the assessment of any of the others? I can't confirm that, Mayor. I'm, I'm not aware of that situation. That's a good question. Well, it would help me make a decision. Uh, if, if I, Thank you, Councillor Muscat. Sorry, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm acknowledging that I have a conflict. I'm not going to talk about the applications. Um, I, um, I will be happy to leave every the, the room for all of them. The problem is that I, I, I'm here as a representative of the residents of this region. Uh, this is public money, and I have questions about the process in um, about uh, how to how we get to the recommendations that we get, and the information we have in the assessment. Uh, panels, which is conf the confidential assessments, and how that is translated to the recommendations. So, I mean, we can talk about that and not talk about um, the, if, because I completely understand what Tanya is saying. B but yeah, these, th those are my questions. My questions are pretty much about the process, and I want to be able to ask those questions about the process. Uh, in relation to how we allocate money through the community investment grants. Thank you. We should probably be able to ask those questions regardless, but um, Councillor Goodluck, what did you have to say? And then I'm going to put my procedural motion. Thanks, Mr Mayor. I, I, I think it's drawing a really long bow um, to suggest uh, that in managing our conflicts that we should take a um, one in all in or one out all out approach with these sorts of assessments. There, there, there's we're talking about minor funding, um, really, in the grand scheme of the, the quarter of a bill, uh, of b quarter of a billion dollar budget, annual budget that we have here. And the reality is uh, that this council table may can decide, has done in the in the past, and may well in the future, to just add additional funding. Um, it's not something that I, I think is a is a, a reasonable. Um, line to draw that a, a councillor would, if they left the room for the the item that they have a conflict uh, in, which is totally appropriate, that they would come in and then try and argue against another group to get more money when there's no, they've got no participation in the decision to where that money would go anyway. It may not go to their organisation. I, I just think in the uh, in the in the Department of Local Government, from the from the the conversations that I've had with them and, and the, the training that we've done and the approach that they appear to me to take, I don't think that would be their expectation of how we manage that conflict. I think that is an extreme uh, overreach, uh, overcautious approach. That's my personal opinion. Happy to stand corrected if someone from the department wants to tell me otherwise. Um, but, uh, you know, this doesn't really, to me, have to be as complicated as it's being made out to be, to be honest. Uh, but I'm happy to stand uh, on, on the record um, if you allow me to stay in the room, uh, if anyone wants to try and say that that's the wrong thing. We, we all want to support, this is about supporting community organisations doing great work in our community. It, it's got nothing to do with personal benefit for councillors. Thank you. I put a procedural motion that um, we split the item. It's been moved by myself, seconded by Councillor O'Grady. Um, any further discussion? Can I put that motion of the five councillors that can vote? All in favour? Uh, motion's carried. We will split the item and we'll start now um, with um, Agenda um, 4.6, Cadargel Development Corporation, Gladstone Ports Corporation, Gladstone Men's Shared Association, Gladstone Car Club, YMCA, Bundaberg, Women's Health, Clarby Rodeo and the Collective Action Social Impact. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, councillors. Um, today we'll review the recommendations of the assessment panel for the applications we've received and the impact and elevator streams as part of the community investment program. We are in an unenviable position where we've got applications worth four times the amount of the funds that remain in the program. Um, unfortunately, we can't fund everything as much as we'd like to, even though they are good opportunities. 
It's been a difficult decision with respect to allocating the funding and we've relied on our robust assessment process as well as officer decisions. There have been some instances in the application assessment where applications have rated highly, however not recommended to be funded at this point in time due to the budget being exhausted. With respect to the application from Oh, sorry, no, I can't talk about GAPDL. Sorry, I'll come back to that one and clear that one up. Sorry. Um, with respect to process, um, Councillor Muska, the applications have been assessed as per the Community um, Investment Program corporate standard. The standard requires three panel members to assess the application. There was one application within the report where one officer has noted a conflict of interest. However, two senior officers have um, assessed that application one officer didn't complete the application due to ill health. So I have moderated that particular um, application though. I invite any questions on those applications we're discussing at the moment. Excellent, I'll start easy. Um, Gladstone Men's Shed, um, I'm glad, I'd like to see them get the 30,000 they've asked for. You're suggesting that we approve that today, which would, would come out of next year's round. So by approving it today, it's included and they're getting the funding, therefore they can apply to the Community Benefit Fund or the Super Round or whatever it's called. So, Mr Mayor, the Men's Shed have already applied to the Super Round. We're just waiting for acknowledgement if they were successful and therefore the $30,000 would then um, be released. So, it's a, it's a bit of a horse before the cart. So, they need the $100,000 before Council can release the thirty. And they're not likely to get... We don't... are not likely to need to pay that till after the end of financial year. I'm confident with that. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Thank you. Further questions, councillors, on those particular items? Councillor Trevor? Uh, Kylie, um, I fully understand your budgetary constraints uh, and the difficult environment that you've uh, had to work within uh, because of those budgetary constraints. Uh, but I just had a couple of general questions um, which in some situations it may be difficult to answer, uh, but the first matter I wanted to talk about uh, was in fact the example I gave when we were uh, talking about splitting these matters and, and that was the uh, YMCA of Bundaberg Limited. Um, You've indicated in the recommendation that the application rated well. Um, would it be true to say that um, had money been available to you uh, to approve this funding, it is more probable than not that the funding would have been approved? Yes, given the panel assessment score, it would have been approved. Right. Uh, and the Gladstone-based service, um, a Gladstone-based service whereby funds weren't absorbed by transport costs would have received further support. Are you saying uh, that because they come from Bundaberg and not Gladstone, uh, that was not a plus for them? It's a, it's a great initiative, Councillor Trevor, um, and the panel did score it really highly. It's not a Gladstone-based service. Um, it's simply um, a transport of some toys from Bundaberg to parents and schools in Gladstone. Um, the panel and myself thought that um, that particular service could be facilitated in Gladstone, um, or they, they're welcome to apply in a future round. And is it the case that uh, a Gladstone-based service uh, isn't currently available and only a Bundaberg-based service is? It's not that it's not available, it's just that we're not aware of it. Okay. The next matter was uh, the Women's Health Awareness Group of Gladstone And the comments in relation to the recommendation uh, were that this application rated for partial funding. Uh, however, Council's Community Investment Program budget 
has been fully expended. Uh, is it more probable than not uh, that had there been additional funds available to you uh, or to the panel uh, that you would have recommended partial funding? And if so, how much partial funding would you have granted? And thirdly, would the partial funding um, have been sufficient to them to enable them to get started? It's a really good question. Thank you, Councillor Trevor. Um, this particular one's a little bit tricky. So this one, um, this application is sees council fund all venues that participate to have the Ask Angela application. Following year one, there's no um, confidence that those venues would then pay their own fees to keep the program um, ongoing. So there is a, there's a sustainability impact there as well. The, um, sorry, Desi, sorry. did you? I was just going to about the Ask for Angela while you're on it, if that's okay, Councillor Trevor. Yes. I just want to touch on that. I thought the council were already supporting that. So has that run out, that um, funding? There was never any funding allocated to that, um, Councillor O'Grady. We have been working with Women's Health on rolling out um, Ask for Angela. Um, I might defer to Bri um, Jansen in this particular instance. She'll have more information. Thanks, Bri. Thanks, Councillor O'Grady. Uh, Council does still f um, support the campaign Ask for Angela, but this application was specifically for development of an app um, which would further enhance um, that campaign. So rather than um, individuals have actually having to walk up to the bar and ask for Angela, literally, and, and have the risk of perhaps the bar staff not understanding what they were meaning, uh, this application would be set up um, so that uh, they could use their mobile phone to actually alert staff. Um, the staff of that club would then know exactly where they were located and needed assistance to be able to assist. So the concept and the campaign, yes, Council does still um, support. This is just a further development in terms of putting it into an actual app. Great, thank you so much. Other questions, councillors? The other yep. uh, third matter uh, that I wish to raise uh, is the Collective Action Social Impact Limited uh, Unleash the Mental Health Champion Within. Uh, and the purpose of the program uh, is such that it will be delivered to senior leaders, community and workplace across a cluster of mental health providers, volunteer-run organisations and workplaces in the Gladstone region. The panel recommendation um, was such that the application rated for partial funding, however, Council's community investment program budget has been fully expended. Is it more probable than not that had funding uh, being available, partial funding would have been recommended uh, by the committee and if so, how much? Um, Councillor Trevor, if we did fund this, it would be funded at um, around the 73% as, um, as per the score. Um, the, we didn't have enough money to fund this particular initiative um, and the panel also um, did note um, that Council has delivered some of its own programs to the community very recently and that is in the form of the mental health first aid courses that we've done across the region and also the developing community leaders. So this was really a value for money um, and looking at our small bucket um, and really trying to place our, our, our funds where we thought we could make the most impact. Thank you. Was Councillor Cameron? Uh, look, just going back to the men's shed there, I, my understanding is that this is conditional upon uh, the men's shed uh, attaining $100,000 from the, uh, is it the, the gambling fund, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, okay. So if they're not successful in that uh, allocation from the gambling fund, do they lose that 30000 Yes, they do. Okay. Um, 
That 30,000 is to um, to build the extension. Mm -hmm. um, they require that it's a hundred. The project requires the hundred thousand and yeah, the thirty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that that uh, it can't proceed unless the, the hundred thousand is there. <clears throat> I don't know. Could we? They will get the hundred thousand from somewhere. Um, is there any way we could secure that thirty thousand for them now? And, Maybe you say that uh, the thirty thousand is not to be released until the hundred thousand dollars is um, secured, without actually specifying that particular funding source. Is it likely? Yeah. Or is it possible? We can amend the recommendation that says that the thirty thousand be allocated um, and payable exactly like you said once um, the additional funding to build the shed is available. Because it's not going to get much of a shed yeah. for thirty grand. Yeah. But. Um, we could definitely amend it so it's not just from the super fund. It's not called a super fund, is it? You're not, going to, you're not going to get a full shed for 100000 No, but you will if you add the 30. If Councillor yeah. Cameron amends the recommendation that says, subject to the, the Men's Shed Association securing the additional funding required, and don't put the source. No, but just the 100000 hmm. Or just additional funding? Because well, the I time think we've they... got to be more specific than that. Well, you can say hundred grand. It just ends up by the time things go on. Everything's going up every day. Yeah. <laughs> be no, 110 this time next week. Um, Thoughts? Yeah. yeah. We can do that when yeah. we put the motion on that. Well, I'd like to put that amendment. Yeah. There, okay. Me. Well, um, yeah. Um, do, if there's any other... I'll, I'll take that and we'll get your mover in a second. Uh, so it would be um, approving all in total with that amendment of the ones that people don't have the conflicts in. Um, is there any other questions or comments around those particular items? Do we all remember what they were? Um, the ones that have been recommended, other than where councillors have a conflict. Yeah, go See? Right. yeah, go for gold. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, I have a lot of, um... So, thank you. <laughs> I'm really confused about the way in which we assess these applications. So I have information here that is also confidential and it doesn't seem to serve. There's a matrix with the, with the summary of all the scoring that doesn't match the recommendations in the report. So I'm at a loss there uh, where there's some that are recommended for funding that they are not recommended for funding and then they are recommended for funding in the report, which are also not um, in relation to their scoring. So they're not the highest scoring, for example. So I also don't understand why some applications have two or three as panel assessors and others have eight. I guess that's part of the process. As I'm, I'm really not understanding why that is possible. Now, there's also another um, concern that I have um, that is probably yeah, in general about the process that we, it is probably best that we look at having a limit in relation to the, the, the applications, a money limit, because we're receiving applications for a lot more than what we can obviously fund. So I'm not sure you know, we can't accommodate those amounts. So that is, in a way, we need to look at that, at this. Um, and then again, I guess it's also tagging on to what um, Councillor Trevor just said. To me, I had very much this, uh, similar questions and a few others that relate to the fact that we're supposed to assess applications on the criteria that we are presented uh, that follows the policy that councillors um, decide on. Now, I don't, um, there's not really room for assumptions or subjective analysis. We're supposed to assess the applications as they are and they're presented to us. So whether we know or don't know whether there's, there's another service here available to, for example, deliver a toy library, is kind of irrelevant to the panel because we're looking at the application that is presented to us from a, an organization which wants to deliver a service in Gladstone, which it's 100% within the criteria. 
we don't have a criteria about where they're located or like, like we have or extra waiting for by local like we do in other tenders. So I don't know where that criteria comes from or that assumption. So I'm very worried about that. There's they also the ongoing service assumption. If there is sustainability, if there is a sustainability issue, then that should be in the criteria and that should be rated and scored accordingly. Well, that's kind of how things are done normally. Um, I completely understand the fact that we're not going to be, you know, well, what, what's going to happen next year when we're not funding it? But that can apply to every single one of these applications. So, including the ones that I recommend for. Um, 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 funding. I'm also concerned about the, the when we say that we exhausted the funding, but we exhausted the funding for all of them in a way. So how are we deciding which one is going to get the leftover that we have? We decided for some to go and then for the other ones we say, oh yeah, yeah, this is great, but we, have, we don't have any more money. So how did we decide where that leftover money was going to be allocated to? I mean, in my idea, and my, my silly brain, I will just go to the numbers and then see which ones are the um, applications that, are, that have scored highest in an unbiased assessment of the criteria. And then I will do that. Now, it comes to us as counsellors and as our job it is to then maybe apply some of that subjectivity and that community knowledge as to whether, well, maybe not these, or maybe we might have to do this and that. Or, and I don't see, I, I, can, I, I kind of see that we haven't been able to do that because it's been done for us. And that wasn't really the role of the officers in the assessment of the applications, if that makes sense. Councillor Muscat, I can respond to that most definitely. Um, and there are some really good points there. Um, the, this is a unique situation at the end of the financial year, at the end of the funding rounds. So we have two funding streams with very limited funds within them. And we've got applications that are totaling $413,000 with a fund of 140. So it's a very difficult um, space to be in. Um, and we've got a range of really great um, applications there. Um, the panel have done their very best at um, providing us with some scores here. And then I've moderated the remaining $30,000 that we've had to allocate to somewhere. And that was based on um, sustainability, deliverability, um, and actually putting something into a program that could actually eventuate. So that, as, a, as the moderator of the program, I've done that, but I'm certainly not the decision mm. maker in this point. Mm. And there's definitely scope for councillors to, to have to put their own um, input into this particular program. We've followed the policy and we followed the standard um, that's in place, um, but we are, we are in a difficult position. There's a quarter of the funding required to fund all of the programs. So we've made um, a decision at the best of our ability to do so. Yeah, I recognise it's a difficult situation. I still find these the way the recommendations are um, not necessarily reflecting the assessments. And I have, um, I, I don't like that as um, a way of administering public funds. I'll take that on notice. Thank you, Councillor Muscat. Okay. Um, would we answer all your questions? I'm not sure. Uh, I think so. There was a couple there. Um, what was the first one? Sorry. In a way, we going back to the system, and I think this is something that I will ask, uh, you know, offline to maybe go back and, or well, not the system, the process in a way, yeah. as to how we are doing this, especially with, um, you know, some things we can do to not find ourselves in this situation, like, you know, not allow ninety thousand dollar applications to come landing at in uh, in front of us, but um, um, yeah, yeah. there is. There's some things we can do like that and others to maybe just cement or maybe train or even change the way in which uh, we have people sitting in the assessment panels, which um, I had different ideas, but I think um, I've been convinced recently that maybe we made a wrong decision a while ago when we decided to take councillors off the assessment panels. Lisa? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to um, just confirm I'm understanding 
um, one of the points you raised, um, which I understand to be about where there is resi residual funding that won't fully fund the, the application that's next in line, um, and whether we have guidance on what we do in that situation, whether it's just whoever comes next gets whatever's left, or whether there's alternative recommendations. That's, that's yeah. What, well, yeah, definitely, just, that yeah, is. Just yeah, to, just want to clarify great. for myself that I was clear on. That. And also, yeah. I mean, if that's the, if that's the way, I mean, do we have procedures to follow to maybe contact the follow the next in line organisation to then say, are you able to do anything with this? Are you able to do anything with that? Because even if we look at the, um, oh, I've got to go back into a bit. If um, the men's shed, I think it's a great um, project and all that, but I still, I don't think they the, they were the highest rated uh, application. If this is where I'm confused, so some anyone that comes and sees these, they see the scores, and then we allocating money differently. No, it's not, it doesn't correlate with the scores. Yes, no, I understand what you're saying. So when you look at the scores, you think, why would that one get funding when it's a lower score? Um, and the explanation has been about the residual available funds. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you, I understand. Yeah, Menshed did um, rate 3.12, which was, was fairly yeah. high, yeah. yeah it's very, yeah, and it's a great project. They're mm. still not the highest, though. Sorry. So Councillor Trevor. I, I don't like picking winners and losers in this situation and, and when I started uh, talking about this issue I prefaced my remarks in respect of the very, very difficult job that you, Kylie, and the committee had uh, in picking winners and losers when there is a finite resource and from what I can see, overwhelming um, uh, credibility for all of these projects currently before you. Uh, and if I had a magic wand, I would wave it all across this page today, which I'm about to do, and suggest that all of these projects receive the funding that they have requested uh, in the presentation uh, that you've put before us today because all of the projects in my opinion are worthy of both support and merit and funding um, and it is my belief that in framing our budget last year we may have underestimated the needs in our community given the current financial uh, circumstances, among other things, that our community is currently facing. Which they weren't 12 months ago. Uh, the whole game has changed in the space of a few short months. Uh, and things have got really tough out there um, for the majority of our constituents. Uh, and I think we could do a lot worse by not providing funding for these projects at a time when our community is hurting. Now, we have funds to support all of these projects if we choose to do so today. The question is, is it appropriate and proper that we do that? Uh, or is it appropriate and proper that we decline what is otherwise, to me, great projects presented to us today? And as you've indicated to me, uh, earlier on today, the only thing that has constrained your committee in providing the funding for these worthy projects is your budget. And on that basis, Mayor, I would be supporting all of these projects in relation to the funding that had they have requested. I, uh here, let me hold that for a second because I do have a mover for Councillor Cameron first, which I haven't got a second of four, and I'll put that. I can come back, or you could amend that recommendation. 
um, after um, Kylie says something, will I take a breath? Um, thank you, Mr <laughs> Mayor. Councillor Trevor, um, these are wonderful projects, you're right, and those that have scored really highly and we haven't been able to fund are more than welcome to enter the application again in our next funding round. We're literally six weeks away from a new financial year where there is budget allocation. So my recommendation would be for those that didn't... Um, that did, were unsuccessful at this particular occasion, um, they could be funded in the next financial year round by submitting their application again. Um, if council, I'll come back to Councillor Cameron's motion very shortly and get a second because then we need to debate that. Um, uh, this, with yeah. this, this particular uh, advancement in yeah. the discussion, it yeah. puts me in. Yeah, a which conflict. is why it puts everybody very much in a conflict goes back straight to, away. Goes back to I just wanted to allow. I'm, I'm not. I'm not disputing what you said. I'm not disputing it at all. That puts me in a conflict it, situation. Well, that's why I'm not getting into that at the moment. I want to deal with Councillor Cameron's recommendation. I'm, in a way, I'm kind of. I don't know. I can see that, but now I'm feeling uncomfortable, and I might want to just take myself off the discussion. Well, we're, we're not discussing yeah. Councillor no. Trevor's suggestion just yet because yeah. I have no. an actual motion on the table from Councillor Cameron that we fund what is recommended currently, with excluding those ones that are not. It doesn't say anything about us stopping funding the ones that aren't recommended. That could still be done as a later motion. This is just the ones that are currently recommended to the amount they're recommended for, um, with the inclusion of an amendment that the Gladstone Shed, uh, Gladstone Men's Shed, um, funding be, be allocated be once they're funding. Sheed, no, for yeah, wherever they get the funds from. Be, yeah, thank you. Once it's um, yeah. the extra funding is sourced. So, that's all we're discussing at the moment. That's the item on the table. So what I'm going to do is get a second for that. I'll come back to what Councillor Trevor said. I'm happy to second the Thank motion, <coughs> provided I'm, I'm seconding the motion that we're only dealing with the matters that we split. That's correct. Thank you. And only dealing with those that are currently only recommended. With those we're not that are dealing with the ones that aren't. That yep. can be dealt with yep. at yep. a later stage. Right up. Yep. So there's no conflict for anyone at the moment. Those I'll come back to your recommendation. Those recommended are Gladstone Cart Club, not for profit house again. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. No. I'll, I'll read them for the, okay, for, I'll read them for the third time if you ah, like. Okay. Thank you. This one's here. Okay, in this list. Sorry, not in the report. No. Okay, fine. In yeah. this It got a little bit confusing. Tanya printers out uh, a sheet so we can deal with these. just these. It is. I appreciate it based on the conflicts presented this morning. So they're all there um, and it's been amended. Let's discuss that and then we can discuss everything else, including what Councillor Trevor has just proposed shortly. Um, Kylie, do you have anything more you would like to add or any of your team? No? Councillor, good luck. Um, thanks, Mr Mayor. So you, you've got a sec mover and second. Second, yes, Councillor okay. so we're Cameron and Churchill. Um, I, I hear what... what Councillor Trevor saying, I, I probably don't agree on this occasion. We're well, not discussing that at the moment. We can't discuss that. That's we can discuss that. We're only talking about the matters on this page, the matters that we've split. We're not talking about any other matters. Well, no, Councillor Trevor he's, wants to fund he's, everything. He's, 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 Councillor Trevor, maybe he can clarify whether he's only talking about the first page of split items, which is what I understood he was talking about. I'm sh uh, I should have made my position clear. I, I, I'm only talking in relation to the matters currently oh. under discussion that aren't in co a conflictual situation oh. and appear on page one of your material. Okay. I am not commenting okay. in relation to page two, three, four or five. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. For the purposes of clarification, they are on page one yep. and page one only. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Trevor. I thought you meant everything and I was wondering where I was going to find all that extra money. but. No, okay. It was probably my fault in that I didn't seek to clarify that in the first instance, Mayor. Okay, thanks, Councillor. Good luck. Um, Kylie, would or someone be able to tell me how much additional funding that would be um, if we were to fund the YMCA, the Women's Health and the Collective Action Social Impact? Could I, could I just perhaps clarify, yeah. Mr Mayor, while Kyle is doing that, that some of those applications were their school would have resulted in partial funding, not full funding? Is, is it that according to the criteria? Yeah, that's the, all yeah, I'm asking. You. Yes. It should be according to the criteria? should be, but 
I think Councillor Muscat made a valid point before about the criteria. So. Well, that's now. Uh, we talk, Councillor Muscat's talking about the policy and we need to have some discussion, I think, down the track, but not here today. We're, we're under the current policy. Mr. If I can... Block, yes. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I fully appreciate Councillor Trevor's um, compassion. I think, from my memory, uh, in, in past times, we have added some uh, small additional funding to cover a small shortfall um, when we had multiple applications that we couldn't fully fund. I don't recall ever having um, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of applications that we couldn't fund uh, and, and making a decision to then go and fund all of those applications. We, I think in this particular case, we did set a budget um, we're about we're in budget deliberations for our next budget. Uh, I think we can make assessments on this as to whether or not we think we want to add some additional funding for in the next budget. Uh, but I personally wouldn't support um, funding all of the projects uh, in this case. Um, it, it also, for me, it goes to um, some integrity or maintaining some integrity within the. Um, investment program process because if you uh, send a message to everyone that you're always going to get funded um, no matter what um, that might send the wrong message to organizations we, we want people to really uh, th these are competitive fundings there's only a certain there's a finite bucket of money and we want people to really put their best foot forward, their best applications forward, come up with the best ideas that are best going to service our community. Um, and part of that is making sure it is competitive to a certain extent. And that's not to su suggest that um, I, I do think that we, you know, have some work to do on the process. I, I appreciate all the efforts and, and, and where we've got to, um, but I do think we, we can refine it further. And that'll probably be discussions for another day. Um, and hopefully that will help support these organisations as well. But I, I think we need to stick with the budget that we set. Um, and then in, in this occasion, there's, there's just too much of a shortfall in this occasion for me um, to, to agree to fund all of those projects, even though I think they're all fantastic projects. But it's not all of those projects, is it? It's just that the ones that we're talking meet the criteria and have scored the percentage that the, 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 the team has put to, put together for us. Thank um, you. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify with the amendment for Councillor Cameron. Um, so you, we are we proposing that we uh, allocate the money in this financial year, but I mean, if they're not gonna, why cannot they? If the money, they're not going to use it this financial year. Why can't we not leave it for next, the next budget? Really, does it need to? Uh, because I guess that makes it difficult. If they're not going to use it in this financial year, and they don't need it until the next round comes at, comes in, why can they not apply in the next round? Or oh, well, we can already say that they're, they're successful, but we make it part of the next year. I'm, I'm, it's just curious because is there a time limit or as to when they have to come up with the $30,000? Um, no, no. My, my intention was to secure the $30,000 with, without a specific condition, but there is still a condition that until they secure the extra funding needed, the $30,000 will not be released. But to do that, you've got to allocate it to a budget, whether it's in this year or next year. And yeah. This is year before us now, and I'd like to see it secured on their behalf. Yeah, and, and I think that's great, but could it be next year instead of this year? That's what I'm just... Because they're not going to use it this year anyway. They would well, have to... Well, there'd be no doubt it'd be in the next financial yeah, year Yeah, that's anyway. what I mean, yeah. But uh, not this one. And I guess it's kind of taken away from other... other well, it's part of the pool of, the, of money. Well, as was pointed out, we're six weeks away from a, from a new year with a new yeah. funding stream. That's uh, what I mean. And this so. is the end of the line for this funding stream. So I'm just trying to get this thing uh, allocated towards the men's shed. Um, the funding stream without starts a specific again. condition for a, for a certain funding stream, that's all. But 
but the, the funding starts again in a, in a few weeks, the same thing. So the budget will, we have a, a budget for next year for all rounds, um, so yeah. the funding could be um, committed from next financial year. Yeah. Yeah, and then we'll start next year's budget, $30,000 deficit straight up, but that's okay. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to take it out of this year's funds or next year's. It doesn't worry me. Well, yeah, now I'm, well, I'm thinking as well, you know, it, going back to Councillor Goodluck's comment, we have a pool of money which is competitive and then we're already um, deciding that um, we the men's shed is going to be one of the highest rating ones next year when we don't really know. Well, so. <laughs> maybe not, but I see your hand up, Councillor yeah. Grady. It was, the, it was re recommended for uh, $30,000. Yeah, well, that's why maybe we need to do it this year so yeah. we don't. Yeah. yeah. Right. Sorry, Councillor O'Grady. I was just wondering about that $30,000, whether they need to have it secured to apply for the, other, um, the money from the other funding they're going for. It's already shot. The Men's Shed have already applied for the super round of the gambling fund. It closed in February, so it's not a prerequisite. The total that's in the recommendation today um, does not include the 30,000. The recommendation was to put it into next financial year upon receipt of approval of the super round community gambling fund. I'm happy with that recommendation. Thank well. you. Yeah. Um, at the, yeah, um, any further discussion on that? Um, I know you're, I'll come back to your recommendation because I can pass that and then you can put a second or we can, it, it can be defeated. But at the moment, the current recommendation from Councillor Cameron and seconded by Councillor Churchill is that we approve the funding on page one um, with the con addition, amended condition that uh, the men's shed funding be allocated once the additional funding is secured. Um, and it's not recommending for YMCA, Women's Health or Collective Action at the moment. Um, it's only recommending those. We, um, that's where we're at. I know this, is, this has gone on for a little while and everyone's had plenty of time to read this and discuss it. I think I can probably put that motion and it can, if it, it'll either win or succeed based on um, its merits and then I can go to you, Councillor Trevor, for an amended. What do you want to tell can me? Just, can I just get clarification? So the officer's recommendation in, is for for, the, for that funding that we've got there in front of us, and then the thirty thousand for the men's shed will be in next financial year. Yep. And the motion that we had moved and seconded is an amendment, which is what? Sorry. Liam, yes, is that the thirty thousand be paid to the men's shed once the additional funding is secured? Currently, the recommendation from the officers, yeah, that's right. But the current recommendation is once that it comes from. Yeah, it's current recommendation from officers that it come from the super, the super round of the gambling benefit fund. Councillor Cameron's saying if it doesn't come from there and they get it from somewhere else, they still get the $30,000, which I think we'd all agree with. If we're going to give them 30000 if they get it from this bucket, we'd be happy to give it 30000 if they get it from that bucket. The thing is, I understand that, but there will be, in our, in our, in our policy, there will be some sort of timing. They can't just hold on to the money for probably over 12 months. So by us giving them the money now, we might set them, if they don't get the 100,000 from the gambling fund and they take a bit longer to get the, you know, addition, well, alternative funding, we still have a 12 month uh, time limit. Is that, isn't that correct? They have, don't they have to spend it within 12 months? Well, I think they might be able to secure the funding in the next few months or something, either side of when that application is approved. Oh, just I just don't want to set them up for failure too either. It, Councillor Muscat, um, just to answer that for you, um, each sponsorship has a relevant sponsorship agreement um, that will outline the timeline of when the funds need to be expended. And after this is put, you'll have the ability to either amend this right now or you can put the motion that the other three be funded as well, Councillor Trevor. Uh, Mayor, I'm happy with the, um, uh, with the advice from Kylie that um, all unsuccessful applicants in this round can apply in the next round of funding in the new financial year. Beauty, thank you for uncomplicating that for me. <laughs> Beauty. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, 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 I
sorry, but I was. Did we get the information about how much it will cost to fund the ones that are not listed for recommended funding? Or? Well, the additional funding request would be one hundred and forty thousand six hundred and fifty, which would total the resolution to two hundred and fifty thousand four hundred and eighty dollars and fifty cents, and that's based on the. Um, funding matrix um, and the assessment scores. So some of the, one of the projects, which is the Unleash, sorry, the Ask Angela would be funded at 80%. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of money. And that goes back to the, the, the fact that we don't have limits. But for example, when you, we look at the YMCA, how much were they asking for? Or their collective YMCA? action social impact, that wasn't that much. That's okay. Excuse me, Mr. Yeah. Sorry. I was just having a look. Um, it says the announcement of the Community Gambling Benefit Fund is four to five months after the funding round closes. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they'll get it. There's only limited. There's a lot yeah. of organisations around yeah. the state that apply for it, and there's only three of them or something. Which is, which is about June, July. Mm. So it's been a difficult one. Thank you to the team for your efforts here. I'm going to put this motion now. We know what it is. Moved by Councillor Cameron, seconded by Councillor Churchill. Is anyone confused about the motion? No? With the motion, all in favour? Thank you. The motion, Council, any opposed? Okay, one opposed. Motion's carried. Thank you. Councillors, we'll continue with this item and we'll um, move to the Boyne Tedham Arts Business Community Association. Councillor Goodluck will declare an interest and leave the room. Sorry, I've got to get through this motion. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Councillor Muscat, yes? Yeah, I just wanted to see because this is also for events. In the in future, it might be good also to have them in two separate items, maybe. I don't know. I guess the, 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 the people applying for events are competing against each other in a separate pool of funding than the community investment. It might be something that might help us in the future to have them separate. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's all, that's all I was gonna say. Carly, do you wanna to talk to this one? Um, absolutely, the um, Under the Trees event um, has been, the request has been 24,000. The panel have assessed it highly at 3.2 um, and recommending full funding at 24,000. Thank you, questions to the general manager, please. Councillor Hanson. Can I move the recommendation? Thank you. Yep, yeah, not for profit house now. Well, I'm starting to think not separating the items might have been a good idea. <laughs> the five of us could have handled it. Um, um, thank you. Kylie, I'm back to you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, this application is from NFP House to um, implement the organisation monitoring and scorecard development. Um, NFP House has developed a Gladstone Region NFP sector report card prototype. The prototype report card is made up of eight elements comprising 32 benchmarks to assess the health of not-for-profit organisations. The eight elements include governance and leadership, planning and policy, financial management, facility and equipment, volunteers and staff, communication, membership, event planning and management. NFP House now wish to proceed to implementation of this prototype through partnering with 40 community organisations using this approach. Um, the thought process behind the allocation of $30,000 was this project is scalable and easy to be delivered. So the recommendation is for $30,000 towards the NFP House project. The prototype, sorry, the um, NFP sector scorecard also um, integrates with the volunteer management and allowing volunteers to be um, paired and matched 
with organisations that require assistance in certain fields. Thank you kindly. Questions to the General Manager, please. Happy to move the recommendation. You have questions? I'll get a seconder first, please. Seconder Councillor, move Councillor Churchill, seconder Councillor Branthwaite. Councillor Muscat, questions? Yeah, this is, again, going back to the, to the scoring. Um, I, I don't understand it. This is not, doesn't look fair to me in the scoring and the, and the matrix and the numbers. I also have questions um, similar to what we discussed before in the process to um, descoping or scalability. I don't know, is that a criteria? Is that something that we go back to organizations and ask? Um, where, how do we arrive at, at the knowledge that something can be um, the scoped or the whatever we call it. I don't understand that because I don't, that, this, that same argument can be applied to other projects in this list. And the other issue that I have, well, I mean, the, the information in the, in the application tells us that they need to have some sort of information or data to get some sort of scoring. On, um, but then we going to de-escalate, de so what is, how is that the same fidelity to the actual outcomes that we were looking at are going to be found? I don't understand. Can you pause? Because I think well, last time I might have missed one of your questions, so yeah. maybe we can answer them as you go. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and the, there's one last one. Okay. To my understanding, this project has already commenced as well, Well, um, and it's funded by the Bendigo Bank. <laughs> a prototype, those, yeah. a prototype has been developed, which may have been funded by Bendigo Bank and NFP House are securing industry and um, council supporters to it. So it hasn't started. The reason this one is scalable is that the same process can be um, implemented with a lesser amount of community organisations. So rather than 40, we could start with, say, 15, 20, 10, whatever. It's a scalable process, whereas the other applications, which I've had, I've had conversations with, which is why I can confidently say it's more difficult to scale the other successful um, application within that list. Uh, okay, I don't, I, I have, I don't have any information that says that organisations have been asked this <coughs> question. So I've asked the question yeah. as a moderator, um, which is part of my role in the corporate standard. Um, yeah. And as we are in the position that we're in, where we don't have all of the money to fund it, I've simply provided a recommendation yeah. based on my expertise. Yeah, okay. which it's kind of again the leftover money that. Um, we don't have a process to follow that it's going to a project and no other really. I don't, it doesn't, to me, doesn't follow the, the scoring and the, mm -hmm. yeah, there's no, and I actually, I don't know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I disagree with the fact that the project hasn't commenced, has commenced. So, I can only go on what the application yeah, has yeah, um, been really given to us. This because I have information there that, um, to say, otherwise, so I'm not sure, which will make the project unelegible, like really, not even, not even accessible, if that makes sense, because our criteria calls yeah. for projects that have not yet commenced. Is that correct? That is correct. That's in our guideline, absolutely. Yeah. The application that's submitted clearly outlines that a prototype has been developed, yet they're seeking to now um, enter into um, partnering with 40 different community organisations using the prototype. So I'm just assessing that based on the application submitted. Can I ask then, what, why, what, what's the reason for why do we don't us give funding to the projects or recommence? Is that just a, one of the, that's just one of the criteria? I did see that in the thing and I just didn't understand why. We just, I guess, so we don't, but you're saying this has commenced. It is in the guideline that yeah, we yeah. don't, yeah. but that's Not certainly really. something we can go back I and reconsider, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's very common. Yeah. It's very common for grants to do that. Like you don't fund something that's already undergone or done or, so it's all for new projects. And that is, the, our criteria has always been like that. Mm -hmm. So 
Okay. Yeah, it's like I will. I have. Um, I'm not. I'm not clear about this. Okay. So, as the mover of the motion, mm -hmm. can it be confirmed that the project has commenced or it hasn't commenced? I'm of an understanding that there was a small model done, or you use the word prototype, prototype yeah. whatever a prototype be it, but it was a small model which now goes into a full-blown model with 40 or 50 or 60 uh, organisations. So Again, Councillor I'm not privy to any other information that may be privy to some um, as such. But you as an assessment panel, you assessed it on the basis of the information that was provided in the application. Thank you. Absolutely correct. Um, yeah, no, and he's just, yes, he is. Um, that's okay, we're back. I think there's some more questions to go. Councillor, good luck. Thanks, Mr Mayor. With, with, with respect to the um, confidential attachments, is there an ability for us to move into confidential to discuss that? No. No, Tanya? They don't, they don't meet the requirements for moving into closed. <laughs> they're in there in terms of, uh, they're confidential for the terms of um, personal information and things like that that are contained within there, um, not because they can be discussed in a closed environment. Okay, well, in that respect, I'll try to articulate it in a in a confidentially non-confidential way. Uh, this one is one, there a number of the assessors' um, feedback highlights some concerns, um, notwithstanding that broadly it's considered a, a great project. The feedback that I read doesn't match in some cases, the scoring, I, I don't. So there's a misconnect there. Um, one, so I, I guess that's not enough for me to not support it, but I just don't, I didn't understand that when I read the assessment. One point I wanted to, to clarify, I think I read that this project wouldn't proceed without full funding. And so we're saying now that it can be staged, is that why we've recommended it for partial funding? So is that part of the process that we follow for other applications as well? So we'll always go back to them and say, can you do it with partial funding, yeah? We should always clarify that, Councillor Goodluck, before we're um, providing partial funding, yeah. Okay. If I can also clarify on the on the attach, on the confidential attachment, there are eight panel members in there, but eight panel members don't necessarily score on every single application. So there's three panel members that have scored on this particular application, and their scores were 3.8, 3, and 3, with a total of 3.02. So there's only three um, assessors to this particular application. There's not been Sorry, there's one application that has had eight, and we are looking at the um, assessment matrix. Not is it? It's not this. No, it's not this one. It's not this particular one. Um, we are bringing a um, discussion to the May June. Sorry, the June forum to talk about our assessment panel for community investment program and some changes we're recommending. Oh, sorry, Councillor Trevor. Um, I've lost my train of thought. Um, Kylie, um, with the partial funding of the $30,000, you've indicated that they can get the project started or, or complement the project in some form with our assistance. Um, will our Assuming that we were to grant the funding today, would that interfere with the other funding that they're seeking in relation to an application that came before us some weeks ago but was deferred? 
uh, and I, I assume the planets are lining up and they're not separate and distinct because it is volunteers or volunteering and as to the best of my recollection five or six weeks ago we were dealing with the same issue uh, that is our volunteers in our region will 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 the allocation of this funding interfere in two ways firstly will it interfere in the application that they make may make at some stage in the future in a tender process because uh, I think that's what might have to happen um, and then the second question I can't remember what I was going to ask so maybe let's deal with the first one. Can I answer the first one for you Councillor Trevor it's a really good question. Um, the the NFP sector report cards um, are a separate program to the NFP House um, volunteer management framework. So they're very different, but they do integrate um, together. Um, so I guess um, fund, not funding or funding, sorry, I'm just trying to articulate what I'm saying here. Um, partially funding um, the application does give them a start on that work um, and understanding the health of community organisations and where volunteers may be matched to, but they are two very separate projects. Yeah. I'm just wondering, I'm just worrying that if mm -hmm. we partially fund this, this mm -hmm. may impact on their ability to proceed down the tender process at yeah. some stage, at some future stage, yeah. with other tenderers. Th yeah. That's what I'm worried about. That oh no, council's provided us with this funding, assuming yeah. that this is the case today. Uh, therefore, we can't apply for that additional funding uh, in the mm. general tendering process at some yeah. stage in the future. It shouldn't. It's a completely shouldn't. different project. So the volunteer framework focuses on. Um, valuing the volunteer workforce and the recognition programs. Um, it talks around growing um, capability and people performance, volunteers' expectations, corporate volunteering, retiree programs, um, the volunteer website, developing volunteer coordinators. So it's a big project all in itself and that's a partnership that Council was seeking um, to export as our discussions before. Yep. Okay. Um, I note they're accepting um, ref referrals from council as well for this because 15 not-for-profits is not many when their target's 500. So they're certainly going to need um, a lot more funding to be able to get to 500, whether it comes from us or somewhere else. Um, good luck to them picking only 15. Sorry. I just don't understand how we can follow a logic in this one and not in the in in other applications. I, I'm having a really hard time understanding. Um, it just doesn't. It doesn't. I don't think anyone watching and any other organisation watching this is not is thinking that this isn't really fair. So and well, one of my top values is fairness. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Okay. Councillor Trevor. Thanks, Mayor. I had one further question. Um, if the council was to decide today that $30,000 should be allocated, are they able to apply for the balance money in the next round in the new financial year? That is to say, they've asked for 84000 Are they able to provide, having provided them with partial funding uh, rather than no funding at all, can they reapply? in the next funding round in July for the balance money. I, 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 know, I know you can if you have been unsuccessful. The question is, if you're partially successful, does that exclude you from a subsequent application in July? Um, it, they would not be able to reapply in the next round because if we did um, fund 30,000, um, the work would have started and therefore under our current guidelines, they would be restricted from applying. And also, I'm sure I read somewhere that if you haven't acquitted a previous grant, you aren't able to apply, and they wouldn't have been able to acquit it because they would have only just started it. So exactly right, Mr. Mayor. Well, well, that makes it very difficult for them, doesn't it? Mm. Um, given those constraints, 
and hence the reason for my question, because with if you are unsuccessful, you can apply, but if you're partially successful to the tune of a dollar, um, it seems unjustifiably wrong that they should be excluded, Mayor. Uh, but we, we, uh, and, and I'm not asking you to reply to that. <laughs> no, uh, of but, but, but what I, and I'm sorry to stare at you when I'm saying it. But, um, but, but can you see, can you see the the imbalance? Can you, can you see the imbalance here? The alternative is that they are not funded at all and asked to reapply next time, and that gives them an opportunity to get eighty four thousand next time or or none. Some they might have been, they might, without speaking for them, be happy to accept thirty and get started. Or they may also be happy to say, no, we don't want the 30, we'll wait and apply and maybe get the 84 next time. But that's a maybe. Who knows what the panel assessment will be and what the officer's recommendation and the councillors decide to do at that point. Um, the, the but we can't, but I just got to say, on, we definitely can't um, amend our policy that um, a project that isn't acquitted can then apply for more funding. or uh, Because it, otherwise we'll have will have given money to community groups, sporting clubs and organisations that don't acquit public funds and meanwhile asking for more and that's just not appropriate. So I get this, the anomaly here though. That puts me in a very difficult position in relation to approving the partial funding or not approving any at all because I don't know whether they would prefer to have no funding at all today and reapply or to have a partial fund funding today and not be able to reapply. Do you, do you see my conundrum yeah. here? Because uh, I'm now perplexed as to what decision I should make given the guidelines that we're bound by, at least at this point in time, because they may not want partial funding. They might want to have a crack at the full funding because that's the only way in which they're going to be able to deliver their project in full. Thank you, Councillor Branthwaite. Uh, sorry, yes. Lisa. Sorry, can I jump to sorry. Lisa? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just wanted to clarify that with the acquittal, it's only if there's an outstanding acquittal, not if you've got an acquittal. You, you've got some funding, so you're doing a project, and then you've got another project coming up. Because I just checked that for my clarification. It's only if you haven't appropriately acquitted previous funding. I just need that for my clarification. That's my understanding. The policy is that you need to acquit the funds completely before you apply for further funds. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Branthwaite. I'll go to Councillor Branthwaite first and then I'll come to you. I've been pretty quiet. <laughs> I've been quiet and listening to everybody's point of view, which is, which is really cool. And some, like, but coming from a uh, major events approval panel in years gone by, I know how hard it is when you've got a restricted amount of, of, um, of funds available. And in, the, in this case, it got actually a 76% approval. So, but we only had $30,000 of that 76% available. So, to be honest, we're actually cutting them short, which is, um, <coughs> if I was them, I'd say, can you keep my application for next time and just re-approve it so that we get the whole amount? And as, as Councillor Trevor says, it, you, know, you, you get caught between a rock and a hard place. And there's obviously, there's obviously a need for this, this and, and others in the whole, uh, across the whole funding application um, spectrum, but um, yeah, I, I'm just wondering whether they questions should be asked to them whether they'd like to have this or or um, or reapply because it does cut them out, as you said. Yeah, it's just the way the way the rules are written. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether we, but <laughs> yeah, I hear the issue, uh, but I also not the, the ones we just approved. Some of them got partial funding as well. Um, and quite often yeah, we get. They, they got all the partial funding. The, 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 these ones were 76% of 96,000. No, sorry, the, the amount requested was 84. So they got approved for 76% of that 84, but only received 30. Whereas the other ones get their, they got their their full funding according to their their qualification percentage. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, the ones that received the funding, others yeah. that rated higher receive zero as well, so that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I hear what you're saying. Um, but I totally... Uh, just, just think about how other people are, are looking at this. 
Yeah, you, look, you can apply yeah. for government funding and, and the funds run out and you, you're out. You just got to look for other funding. You yeah. know, it's just it's life. But I don't envy your position, Kylie, having to make that recommendation. <laughs> Thank you. I, and I, I get it. <laughs> and that's now, I think it's been scrutinised enough, though. Is there any further questions? Councillor Muscat. I just want to make a comment that I'm sorry, but I can't support this application because I know that this project has commenced. So. Or my, or I have information that is very similar in within another project that has already commenced. So I'm, I'm kind of, I can't do it. So. But, but that puts us all now that you've said that, and I respect what you've said. Please don't read me wrong. But you've now put us all in a very difficult situation in relation to approving or not approving this today, because we are now privy to information that we may not be supporting our guidelines yeah, because we now before. potentially have knowledge uh, that the project has started. That, uh, I'm, I'm, now, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now conflicted, am well, I not? Well, uh, um, Councillor Trevor, I've said not that earlier, that I believe critical. that the project Please has commenced. It might be a different one. I just really need to clarify this. Okay. I'm not really trying to... Uh, to me, there's a number of questions here and I, I don't want... Um, the public to there's already the the scoring situation there's already the partial funding and there's also the question on the commencement of the project i'm just there's too many questions for me so um <coughs> yeah matt I'm, well, hang on just wait on the move of the motion here i, I might do a point of order but yeah, i'm well, reluctant to, to at this you stage to, based on I'm, what councillor trevor's just said i think maybe we will break well um, no and I asked. I'm not comfortable now to put the motion. Well, I'm the mover of the motion at this stage, yeah. and I asked the question openly before of the panel, the people that are providing the information to us here today, or based on the assessment and the information that you had before you, that there was a project that was a prototype of a small model, that's. Uh, and now, like they do in industry, they do a little prototype, then they need investment into the bigger whatever, the, and that's the way I'm viewing it as well. We're now turning this into a much larger, full-blown project based on the success of the small prototype. Is that the way the panel... That you, I asked the question before and you gave me the answer and I was comforted by the answer. At the time of the application assessment, we had no knowledge that the project had started. It was simply a prototype that they wished to expand to 40 community organisations. I heard that, then I also heard what Councillor Muscat said, and I'm hearing what Councillor Trevor said, and I think um, it's quarter to one, and we might, I think, I can, I can easily put the motions moved and seconded. I think we should hold it over. Um, break for lunch and come back and I can continue on where we're at. If, you if, if you're going to break for lunch, Mayor Matt, and I'm not opposed to it because I, I, I actually have to declare something right now. I need to get to the gents very rapidly. Very good. But very in well. light of saying that, I'm prepared to hang in with the pain if it's the basis of the debate because are we deferring to have lunch or are we deferring to go and get more information because Councillor Goodluck rightfully asked the right question much earlier. If someone, whoever, is privy to confidential information over and above whatever the panel had before them at the time to make that assessment, then somehow under the Local Government Act, we need to be able to discuss if there is information that is contrary to what we are considering uh, or contrary to what the panel had at that particular time. How do we get that out? Because the advice we got before is that we can't go into, um, into a confidential meeting. We're not going into a confidential meeting. Um, because we can't, <laughs> but we can definitely break for lunch, hold it over, and um, if we can't, I don't know whether we should be sourcing more information during that time, but um, if we can't get it, then we can easily hold the motion, that item over, or we can just vote on it. But I think it's quarter to one, and I'm not really comfortable putting this motion now. Um, Mayor, Mayor, I, 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 you want to get I, to the I, toilet too. I do. <laughs> and, 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 so, and so do I, but I... Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but, but I just from a procedural point of view, uh, we've adjourned in the middle of a uh, motion that has, hasn't been put to a vote. Um, 
CEO and Head of Governance, mm -hmm. are we excluded from talking to each other during the break in relation to this particular matter? You're welcome to discuss this matter outside the meeting, but not with Councillor Hanson, who has a conflict of interest. Oh, I'd prefer Debate that. should be reserved I'd pre prefer for councillors didn't discuss it um, until we come back, unless you want me to put the motion now or, and vote on it today. I'm not comfortable in breaking I'll, from a live stream council meeting. I'll respect your judgment on that. I'm not bringing forward a point of order. Um, far from it. I think we'll break and we won't discuss no. it at all during I'm the lunch break. Being, I prefer I'm just that. being very particular yes, in view of the recent laws in relation to everything. Yeah. Again, this is just another prime example. I think that's where Councillor Goodluck, I, I, I stand to be corrected, but that's exactly where Councillor Goodluck was coming from there before, is our endeavour to be able to discuss matters that are pertinent and important to ensure that we make a fully informed decision as it is today, and unfortunately, under the Act, we're, we're limited or we can't uh, go into um, confidence. Thank you, Councillor Cameron, before I Yeah, break. just one point. If, if we're not going to discuss it whilst we're having lunch, yeah. just one point is we're not funding the prototype today, which has already started. We're funding <coughs> the furthering of the project outside of the prototype. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks mean, like. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to... I don't need a motion to move to a comp to lunch, do I? Just say I'm going to... Adjourn the meeting um, and we'll have lunch and we'll return soon after. I need to move the motion. Tanya, don't need a second or do I? I second that. I'll take Councillor Trevor as a seconder. All in favour to adjourn. Thank you. Adjourned. Thank you, Councillor O'Grady.
sign up to Council's disaster and weather event warning system. Receive alerts about emergency news, severe weather events and other public safety alerts via SMS or email. Registering to the disaster messaging system is free. To register, visit Gladstone Regional Council's Region Watch website and click on the Register for Warnings button. Get ready, Gladstone. Take the steps to protect what's most important to you. Let's be better prepared and protected for emergencies and disasters. Gladstone Regional Council are committed to fostering a proud, involved and engaged community. The Gladstone Regional Council Community Investment Program provides financial support to local community initiatives, projects and events which promote community connections, regional enhancements, community celebrations and community education. For more information on the Community Investment Program, visit gladstone.qld.gov.au. Gladstone Regional Council. Connect. Innovate. Diversify.
Illegal dumping and littering is a concern across the Gladstone region, with over 134 offences in the last 18 months. Our region is beautiful, but there are a few bad apples that ruin it for the rest of us, and they need to clean up their act. Commonly found items at illegal dumping sites across the region include car bodies and batteries, mattresses, tyres, white goods and furniture, and green waste. These items can be disposed of at any of the region's waste transfer stations, some of them even for free. Illegal dumping and littering pollutes our environment, harms plants and animals, and detracts from the enjoyment of our public spaces. It can lead to stormwater and ocean pollution with large amounts of plastic, sugar sachets, and cigarette butts caught in stormwater traps and grates. It's cheaper for everyone to dispose of waste correctly. Illegal dumping and littering cost our ratepayers thousands of dollars each year in waste management and cleanup. It's also costly for our dumper with penalties of up to $10,000. We can all work together to keep our region beautiful and dispose of waste responsibly by placing rubbish in the bins or even holding onto the rubbish until you're near a suitable bin and using our local waste facilities. Don't be part of the problem of pollution we want you to be a part of the solution. From towns to the bush, illegal dumping and littering is everybody's responsibility. Protect our public spaces and natural environment by doing the right thing for today and tomorrow. If you see illegal dumping, dob in a dumper. See it, report it, stop, stop it. it.
Sign up to Council's disaster and weather event warning system. Receive alerts about emergency news, severe weather events and other public safety alerts via SMS or email. Registering to the disaster messaging system is free. To register, visit Gladstone Regional Council's Region Watch website and click on the Register for Warnings button. Get ready, Gladstone. Take the steps to protect what's most important to you. Let's be better prepared and protected for emergencies and disasters. Gladstone Regional Council are committed to fostering a proud, involved and engaged community. The Gladstone Regional Council Community Investment Program provides financial support to local community initiatives, projects and events which promote community connections, regional enhancements, community celebrations and community education. For more information on the Community Investment Program, visit gladstone.qld.gov.au. Gladstone Regional Council. Connect. Innovate. Diversify.
Illegal dumping and littering is a concern across the Gladstone region, with over 134 offences in the last 18 months. Our region is beautiful, but there are a few bad apples that ruin it for the rest of us, and they need to clean up their act. Commonly found items at illegal dumping sites across the region include car bodies and batteries, mattresses, tyres, white goods and furniture, and green waste. These items can be disposed of at any of the region's waste transfer stations, some of them even for free. Illegal dumping and littering pollutes our environment, harms plants and animals, and detracts from the enjoyment of our public spaces. It can lead to stormwater and ocean pollution with large amounts of plastic, sugar sachets, and cigarette butts caught in stormwater traps and grates. It's cheaper for everyone to dispose of waste correctly. Illegal dumping and littering cost our ratepayers thousands of dollars each year in waste management and cleanup. It's also costly for our dumper with penalties of up to $10,000. We can all work together to keep our region beautiful and dispose of waste responsibly by placing rubbish in the bins or even holding onto the rubbish until you're near a suitable bin and using our local waste facilities. Don't be part of the problem of pollution we want you to be a part of the solution. From towns to the bush, illegal dumping and littering is everybody's responsibility. Protect our public spaces and natural environment by doing the right thing for today and tomorrow. If you see illegal dumping, dive in a dumper. See it, report it, stop it.
Sign up to Council's disaster and weather event warning system. Receive alerts about emergency news, severe weather events and other public safety alerts via SMS or email. Registering to the disaster messaging system is free. To register, visit Gladstone Regional Council's Region Watch website and click on the Register for Warnings button. Get ready, Gladstone. Take the steps to protect what's most important to you. Let's be better prepared and protected for emergencies and disasters. Gladstone Regional Council are committed to fostering a proud, involved and engaged community. The Gladstone Regional Council Community Investment Program provides financial support to local community initiatives, projects and events which promote community connections, regional enhancements, community celebrations and community education. For more information on the Community Investment Program, visit gladstone.qld.gov.au. Gladstone Regional Council. Well, thank you, councillors. Thank you, officers. Um, we'll return to the agenda. Uh, we're still on item 4.6 um, and discussing the not-for-profit house. Kylie, did you have some additional information for us, please? I do. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Um, I can confirm that the application that's been submitted to council differs to that that's been funded by the Bendigo Bank, um, and that's whereby community organisations are assessed on their overall health. Um, which is the tool that they use. However, they're also then supported with targeted financial mentorship um, to improve um, their capability in that area. The application submitted to council is simply to um, fund the tool and to assess the organisation's general health on the eight sectors that we talked about earlier. I can also confirm that um, NFP House um, are agreeable um, to the $30,000 of funding. They would be very appreciative and thought it would be a great start for the project. Happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, Carly. Any further questions for our general manager, please? No. No further questions? Okay. I did have a, a mover. It was Councillor Churchill and I think Brentwaite. Sorry, I wrote this down. Yep. 
Brent Wayne. Um, any further comments or questions? Um, which is the officer's recommendation of thirty thousand dollars. I put the motion. All in favour? Those against? Motion is carried. Thank you. We'll um, move to the next item, which is the GAPDL event. And if Councillor Branthwaite could swap with Councillor Hanson, that'd be great. Are you doing the event one as well? Okay. Welcome back. Thank you, Rick. Over to you, Kylie. Thank you. We enjoyed it the way it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Councillors, thank you so much. Um, this funding application is from GAPDL for the request of event equipment to the value of $23,724. Uh, dollars. The panel have assessed it. It has rated um, as no support at 2.09%. Um, so the recommendation is to not proceed with funding for this particular um, request. Thank you, Kylie. Questions to the general manager, please. This is the event. <laughs> The amount was $23,724. Um, the panel viewed it as an operational cost. Councillor, good luck. Uh, Mr Mayor, I'm happy to support uh, the officer's recommendation. Uh, no doubt this is a worthy cause, but given the fact that we have uh, exhausted the budget um, in particular, and perhaps uh, this might be the subject of a future application with some additional um, content or something in, in the future. So but mainly based on the fact that we've exhausted the budget. So unfortunately, this one just doesn't make the cut in this round, but encourage GAPDL to try again next time. Thank you. Are you moving that way then? Yes. Yes, move, Councillor. Good luck. Uh, seconder. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Is there any further questions or comments? Okay, I'm gonna put the motion now. All in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. And then the next item is GAPDL as well. Um, communities for children. Back to you. No. Oh, Councillor Braithwaite, yes. Just not, not Councillor Moscat. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the next application we're looking at um, is the um, GAPDL's Community for Children's um, NAN project or their Nurture and Nutrition project. This is an amazing um, initiative that's delivered by um, stronger communities um, as part of C4C. Um, and like our community investment fund is significantly oversubscribed. Um, the application is to deliver an additional session per week in Gladstone and Calliope. Um, I've spoken with Wendy Morris, the executive of um, C4C, and we discussed the, um, the likelihood of partial funding being applied in this instance and the fact that it's actually more difficult to get staff and get momentum with the project by just partially funding. I've suggested to Wendy that she reapplies in the new financial year for full funding. Thank you, Kylie. And there was a question about um, somewhere in the report it referred to funding 
Um, can you look at that for Absolutely, me? Absolutely, Mr that? Mayor. I do wish to clarify, there is a misunderstanding in the report that I sincerely apologise for. The $140,630 that's contained in the report is actually an in-kind payment from GAPDL for the use of the Nutchi building by community partners. It's a really great initiative that they do. Um, as part of um, GAPDL's service. So I can confirm that that's not from Council's tourism funding. Excellent. Thank you. Any questions for the General Manager, please? Okay. Can I have a move for the officer's recommendation? Or otherwise. Thank you, Councillor O'Grady. Seconded. Councillor Branthwaite. Any further questions or comments? Put the motion. All in favour? Motion's carried. Thank you. Um, we'll ask Councillor Muscat to return. And thank you, team. <laughs> okay, the next item on the agenda is G4.7, which is a Regional Arts Development Fund Round 1. Um, and I'll hand back to you, Kylie, and your team as well. Councillor, good luck. Uh, he's declared, has declared a conflict of interest in leaving the room. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, today we're talking about our Regional Arts Development Fund and I've got Kim Marks and the Acting Manager of Strategy Improvement and Felicity Barker, the Acting Manager of Arts and Entertainment with me here today. Council received 14 applications for round one of the RADF um, funding round. Sorry, I've just lost my place um, for round one. And of these, nine are recommended for funding. The applications that we've received are a beautiful mix of music, drama, social history, visual and performing arts. It's really pleasing to see um, the diversity in the applications. In addition, Council has received three outcome reports from previously funded RADF projects, and they are from Joe Williams for the Scapegoats, Scapecoats, pardon me, Eloise Bowen from Capellia, and Luke Rathel for our Voice in Colour. Um, in addition, councillors, you'll see um, in the recommendation is that um, we're also um, seeking to return funding for the GPC pop-up Art Village, which was part of the Gladstone Harbour Festival, which was funded in round two, 2018, 2019, and has not been fully completed. Um, the committee have declined a fifth project extension request and are ex uh, requesting the return of less than $5,000 for the uncompleted project. Uh, reasoning for that is there's been no progress towards an outcome um, across the previous four extensions. Of the five applications that have not been accepted in round one, the RADF committee provided the following context. Um, Colleen McRae, um, the application was not clear with respect to the additional research that required to be undertaken to develop the e-book. The committee will welcome a future application from Colleen for a future round with more detailed information. Mackenzie May Music, this ap sorry, this application was incomplete. So the committee recommends a future application from Mackenzie May with the support of an RADF mentor. Spring in the Vale, um, this application better aligns with the um, key selection in the Community Investment Program rather than the RADF program, which promotes arts and culture development. The Integrate, um, Integrate Gladstone application was late um, and unfortunately not complete. Um, the committee assessed the application on this particular instance. Um, however, the amount of funding was not complete in the application and therefore we have not funded on this occasion. We do welcome another application in the future from them. And Katrina, Al um, Katrina Elliott for the development of a public art master plan for Calliope. This was unsuccessful given council is currently developing its own region-wide master plan. The committee noted when, following, when considering this application that public art master plans are usually owned by the local government body. Um, and not an individual artist and this work would be a duplication of effort in saying that though the plan for that regional art master plan is to engage community and artists and if we did do when we sorry when we do engage local artists we will follow the local government procurement processes that we need to abide by I invite any questions from councillors thank you councillors questions to the general manager Did please I miss anything? okay thank you councillor Branthwaite Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> oh, just with reference to Katrina, um, the Boyne 
Tannum Turtle Bay asked Scott Scape, how's, how's that work? So I presume, like Katrina, she's a really good artist, done a lot of work in our region, and obviously being proactive and, and uh, wanting to do something or design something that fits in with the community. But, you know, I'm not sure that she wants to own something, but in saying that, we've got the, like, the Turtle Way Artscape. How, do, how does that work? So the Turtle Way Artscape is a little bit different in that they are their own organisation. Uh, they don't necessarily seek their funding from council. They need to go through the public art um, process to get approval for use of land. Um, but they have established their own plan uh, with industry partners um, that they obviously bring to council when they're seeking approval on particular projects. So would be Katrina be do doing something completely different to, to what that is? I think in this instance, um, developing a public art master plan for a particular part of the region would be a bit different. Um, so the Boyne Tannum Turtle Way Artscape will feed into Council's master plan. They'll be engaged through part of that process. I didn't realise there was a master plan with Council of Art down there. Yeah, uh, so we're preparing one at the moment. Oh, right. Yeah, so that's where we mentioned a duplication of effort is that council are currently undertaking a public art master plan for the whole region. Okay, we'll great. have sub plans that address. I just think that the person would be a bit ticked off if they got well, said read that and rather a single artist only community art plan. I just think they might put someone's nose probably really, really out of joint by sort of saying a statement like that, you know, because I don't think that's the intention at all, from what I gather. But yeah, thank you, Councillor Muscat. Um, yes, thank you. Oh, man. Um, actually, I read the application for Katrina, and I think it's really good. I don't understand. Well, again, this is going, and I've raised this in the past when it comes to our ADF processes. I don't see a process here that I can. To me, it's more like I'm just rubber stumping. I don't see. Um, I, I'm not saying it's not a reflection on the on the committee that decides this, but I don't have that information that the committee has. So I just have to. I guess trust that they have a, a process because I don't see the process, I don't see a scoring, I don't see how the application score against the criteria like I do with others. I know it's different um, type of money, but I mean, not necessarily. Some of the high, uh, the ones over 10,000 are the same as the ones that we just discussed um, a few minutes ago. So I, I think the issue here, I can see where you come from with the master plan, but Katrina didn't apply for a master plan. Katrina applied for a concept plan. Katrina, I think maybe in hindsight, it's just all to do with language. Because if she would have said something like, which she explained that actually what it was, it's consultation with community to get, um, I guess, feedback from people from Calliope um, around what they want to see uh, and how to make it happen, including you know what permits they want to get, what potential funding there might be out there to do it. And she's only asking for not a lot of money, and, to, and I, I think it's a, a fair piece of um, work, what she's going to be doing. So I've done, personally, concept development applications. So the RADF has uh, different, different categories for anyone that's out there that doesn't know. So you can apply for personal development, you can apply for artist fees, you can apply. And one of those ones is concept development. So I've applied for the, um, applications under that category to do pretty much similar things, which is community consultation and then produce a plan that she clearly states in her application that is for public use. So I think this is a missed opportunity for us when we eventually do the master plan, and which we need to say also that we've been planning on this one for the last, you know, I think 2018. Calabi doesn't have that much art happening. She's been really proactive in that space, trying to get some of this stuff happening, which is non-existent down there, or very little of it. And I think this will be wonderful to fit into our future master plan when, you know, as a, another piece of consultation, another piece of work that's gonna fit into it. So, you know, if we were to call it um, Art in Calliope Community Involvement Project, we probably wouldn't have been able to use the argument about the master plan is got to be delivered by council or be, or be owned by council. And yet again, she didn't call it master plan. We did. So I'd um, like to, um, for us to reconsider. I think the funds are not, they, we don't have limitations with the funds. I've seen it. And I'd like to see this 
funded if possible, unless there's any other issues why we can't. Now, the other one is um, I wanted to get more information on the other application for... Uh, there's a quick question. Is the Turkey Beach Progress Association only asking for $100? No, they asked for thirteen hundred. Now I was getting to that one when, oh. when it was my turn no, no. to talk. <laughs> That's the project total. Oh. Anyway. oh. Okay, sorry. It's uh, okay. the thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, sorry, thirteen hundred was the project, and they yeah. did ask for a hundred. But okay. yeah, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So the the one for the other one that is not recommended for Colleen Joy McCray. I understand that the the um the lack of information about what additional research, but because I don't have any more information in here, the only thing that says in the list of applications is that she is asking for money to compile, create, and publish, uh, publish an e-book. So I don't know where the research question comes in. She's, only, she's asking for time and her time and all that to compile, create, and publish a, an e-book about social history. So I don't understand why we're not funding it. Sorry. Sorry, for <laughs> Process Council, Muscat, can I just answer your first question yeah. around, <laughs> Sorry, um, not, around Katrina <laughs> Elliott? Um, the, yes, she may not have called it a master plan, but the efforts that she's described within that application duplicate the effort that we're currently going through. So if we were to engage Katrina to do that work, and I agree, she's a beautiful artist and she does a lot for Calliope, we would just need to do it through a procurement process and not through a funding application. So there is still yeah. opportunity for her to participate in the public art master plan, which the scope has just about been um, defined for. Um, so there is opportunity for her. I just wanted to close that out because it's not that we don't want to support her. We just need to use the right process to do so. I completely understand. I think she's wanting to do a separate project to just get some stuff happening. And it's not a master plan and it's a missed opportunity for us. So I will request that we consider funding it. I can speak a little more to um, Colleen McRae's as well. So a large portion of the budget that was submitted with the application was allocated to research. And the committee just couldn't see that it was additional research to what had previously been done for the app to then um, warrant the costs that were associated with that um, in the budget. Hearing loud and clear that you might need a bit more information to make informed decisions in the reports because um, the RADF committee uh, will only make recommendations to council and of course the final decision is yours. Was there, was there any budget items in relation to the compilation, the publishing? Because why can't we not then offer her that part of the funding and not the, maybe the, that's been done in the past, I've been part of it, you know, sometimes. Rem remember getting you know, uh, phone calls from Di and say, we can't fund this, but we can't mm. fund that. So Partial funding could be an option. Um, I probably would like to acknowledge at this point that we don't have a partial funding um, matrix or scope yeah. within the regional arts development You're using the budget items. <clears throat> Earlier to your point, um, historically, regional arts development fund probably hasn't had a huge amount of governance around it. So we have moved to the online platform that gives scoring and criteria, um, the same as the community investment program. We can now give you some confidence behind um, how we came up with the outcomes or how the committee came up with the outcomes. Uh, perhaps we just need to provide a bit more of that context in the reports. Yeah, well, either that or we find another way in which it doesn't have to come here because I feel uncomfortable having to put my hand up or not without understanding what, what it is that we giving money to. So we do, we go through processes that are operational all the time. So this isn't about, uh, I think the RADF committee does a great job. I just don't understand why then I has to come here and I have to make a decision on something I don't understand. And I've raised this before, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. But I, I like to, um, if I yeah. may, I like to amend the, the uh, officer's recommendation to fund Katrina's f um, project. 
and any co any items that are not re research in Colleen's application, but I don't know that um, the right. cost of that. Well, I'm happy to accept your motion once I have a dollar figure. If there's someone who can give us that, otherwise I can't possibly support a motion that doesn't tell us yeah. what the cost of council yeah, is. You. Yeah. So at the moment it's two three thousand four hundred and twenty two dollars and forty cents for Katrina Elliott's um, requested funding and the Colleen McRae partial funding was how much? We don't know. We'll wait while we find that. Um any Councillor Churchill as Sorry? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that that was for that was for the whole project, Councillor Muska. You're referring to a partial funding of yeah the items because I understand that the the committee couldn't see where the extra research needed to happen, mm -hmm. but there will be some allocation to research and some allocation to um, the what is it in the description of a project, which is compilation, creation, and publication, unless they're not eligible items under RADF. But I didn't think that was the case. We're just getting that amount now. Yeah. Okay. So the whole project is 21,234. So she's requesting 13 for everything, but I can I know the concerns of the committee, but the concerns of the committee are not uh, speaking to the compilation, creation and publication. They're speaking to the research, which... We don't have that mm. information, so... While Kylie and Kim are looking yeah. that up, Councillor Churchill, as the chair of our ADF, did you have any comments to make? Yeah, thanks for the invite, uh, Mayor Matt. Um, what comment would you like me to make in relation to what? Or which know. particular one? Because I think the, whole report. The, the, the committees made unanimous decisions based on good governance in the process of the information. If you wanted me to get down to the specifics, I have a clear recollection of that one in relation to the additional research that was to be undertaken because there was already a, a project that had been successfully completed uh, that had been put down onto an app which uh, now the applicant was now wanting to convert that project into an e-book and appropriately was requesting funding for additional research and travel and uh, accommodation and as part of that additional research mm -hmm. and the committee unanimously agreed and decided that we needed to get a clarification on what was the additional research that was going to be done, where was it going to be done, how was it going to be done, why was it going to be done in, in relation to what had already been uh, a great project by the proponent previously in collecting, collating, compiling and delivering um, a great outcome from all the information that they had. So it was a question that had to be asked and effectively uh, the committee were not in a position at that particular time to fund the project in its entirety as we've been discussing in this previous agenda item uh, and we needed to go back to the applicant and ask the applicant to be able to provide us with all that additional information so that we could consider that in a favourable way based on their response in the next round. So, you know, partial funding is not part and parcel of what the RADF committee do in relation to particular projects, but they can fund components of a project, um, but this idea of putting partial funding, that, that's, you know, I'm sorry, that, that starts to question the integrity of the funding partnership that we have with Arts Queensland and, and the Queensland Government. Sorry, I was so, so we're not opposed to the project. The, the committee was certainly not opposed to the project. In actual fact, in good governance, it was, it was to make a determination so that we could get a clear understanding my other comment, uh, so that's in relation to the project because the, the committee felt that it was quite an exciting project based on the next stage of the, the app to make it into an e-book and be distributed throughout the world. I think that's fantastic. And we even believe that it's probably got another part of it for longevity 
without without suggesting that there's another project after it, but that, that's what we're trying to build. We're trying to build sustainability. And in the RADF program at the moment, we're now looking at the three-year, the three-year proposal with the option of not just a one-year, but a two-year and a three-year. And that's in partnership with the Queensland Government, uh, Arts Queensland, so that's good. The, the other part, uh, and I've just, uh, I'll just detract just slightly, was that trying to understand at this particular stage, uh, and I'm very mindful of the recommendations, but in relation to any of the other projects uh, that we funded over a period of time, since we've gone on to the Smarty Grants portal, because prior to that, and all previous RADF committees, and having been the chair since 2017, 2018, we used to get a big pile of papers, you know, so high for each one of the volunteer committee members to plough through in relation to not only the applications but the assessments. So the Smarty Grant now has streamlined it. But because we're also online on a Smarty Grants program, the applicants are required to fulfil the needs of what they do online, meaning to say we, 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 we can't accept an application if they don't put in an, a budget or a quote or, a, or, or whatever the other necessary, and the, and the officers are much more familiar with it than me, the Smarty, the Smarty Grants, online, because previously the RADF committee would allow some latitude common sense, some, some, some latitude, some flexibility that if we actually received an application and it was d uh, deficient in some way of a quote or an ABN number or, or anything else that was supportive of the application, we would tend to hold it, go back to the applicant, ask for the additional information and then by rights we would endeavour through a, a flying minute distribute a request amongst the committee so that we could then bring it to the full council for deliberation. So hopefully that, that explains that the Smarty Grant is now meant to streamline the process and they have to fulfil all the box, fill in the boxes because if you don't fill in the boxes, you're not going to be eligible. Thank you. Hopefully that helps. Charlie, did we find that figure? We did. Thank you, Councillor Churchill. From that, I'm not asking for part funding. It's just that other items that were not research. That's, that's, all. that's what we're getting here from Kylie now. Yep. Thank you. And Councillor Churchill, thanks for acknowledging the improvements because we have made a lot of improvements in the RADF process. So thank you for that. Um, the amount that um, relates to research is the majority of the funding, which is $12,800, which is the reason why the committee wanted to explore what the additional research was for. Um, sorry, how much was it? No. The original application was $13,485. Yep. The component in question was the um, genealogist, $12,800. Is that the... The remaining, the remaining bits of funding is whole hire for the genealogy society oh. and things like that. So without the research, I don't know if there's value in partial funding. Yeah. I, I see that. See, that's kind of some of the things that I would be able to gather if I had the information, but... So do you, do you want your motion to be just the 3,422 like for Katrina Elliott? Or do you want it to be the 13,485? And then I'll have to seek a seconder. Uh, I will, um, I guess, in this case, since I will recognise the, the RADF judgment in, in not, not having enough information about what the research was going to involve, so... Um, I guess hopefully we can go back to Colleen and, and try to get some more information. So no, we'll just leave for the Katrina Elliott to okay. be funded. Okay. Um, so your recommendation is, as per the officer's recommendation, with the inclusion of $3,422.40 for the Katrina Elliott's project in Calliope. Do I have a second for that? Thank you, Councillor Branthwaite. Uh, any further comments or discussions on any of the other items? <laughs> Councillor Muscat. Sorry. Um, I think the um, Smarty Grant is wonderful. So that was, I wanted to ask if there was any feedback from people because I know that was another thing that was definitely um, a big improvement. Those forms were terrible before. So. We had a positive response to Smarty Grants. It has probably changed some of our other processes. So mm -hmm. um, we'll continue to communicate with the community yeah. about moving to the platform. Uh, but we did have a great uptake um, 
similar, if not more, applications than previous um, couple of rounds. Yeah, so, that's obvious yeah. too. It's really good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Churchill. Rick. You're going to move and a seconder for the motion? Uh, I have a mover in Councillor Muska and a seconder in Councillor Branthwaite, then yourself and then oh. Councillor Hanson to comment. No. Oh, okay. Just yourself. I can understand the intent of the motion at this stage based on the information that was brought before the RADF committee. And I myself personally know Katrina as a great artist. He's, he's actually delivered highly successful, inspiring and, and aspiring uh, artwork within the community and was uh, the successful deliverer of a public art uh, on, the, on the Dawson Highway there most recently and has been a very successful recipient of the RADF committee funds. However, in this particular circumstance, and, and, and I share some information appropriately from the RADF committee, is that from a good governance perspective and from my understanding and what the committee had to deal with at that particular time, is, which was a unanimous decision appropriately, based on what we had been forecasting to do for some time was to do a master public art plan. And, and what uh, the applicant was proposing was to do uh, a community consultation and the information's there before you in determining what the sub plan might be or what would be good for, um, for Calliope for the future of that public art. From my, from my perspective, and I know that I've been asking a few times in relation to this master plan and I remember in 2019, we were moving ahead and then COVID came along and, and thus the potential for it to progress or proceed uh, was halted, if that's probably the better way to put it. Uh, and then what was the needed or the, the budget requirement to deliver a master plan for the region? And then I have a very good recollection of the discussion that occurred uh, by the volunteer committee in relation to um, the risk to council or potential risk to council um, and the partnership with the Queensland Government through Arts Queensland. And it is a good project. The committee recognised that the, the, the idea is wonderful. It's a fantastic idea. The IP, having considered that some of us, including all of the RADF committee, have just been through a legal uh, workshop in relation to, and others in the public have as well, in relation to ownership of um, public art, uh, the intellectual property, copyright, and, and the list goes on, and the potential for litigation, um, and the community consultation on art, on community and council's infrastructure. There's a whole range of questions that come out of that, and it's not just even though I'm a strong supporter of the arts fraternity, it's not just about the arts fraternity, it's the community in its entirety agreeing to effectively, well, again, the, the concern that the, the committee had was raising expectation that we're going to do or something is going to happen or uh, limiting the potential for what would be done, whether it was going to be themed for just Calliope. And the other part of the discussion was Okay, well, good for Calliope, but is there a potential for Katrina to be able to do Baroran and Banarabi? And then the list goes on from Baffle to Agnes Water. So is there the potential now for 14 sub-region uh, art plans, public art plans? And the other limiting factor was one other one as well. That one other limiting factor was that it's not just about the community. When we talk about public art, we also talk about infrastructure that belongs to Ergon, um, you know, government-owned corporations, and the list goes on. So for the potential, not that uh, Katrina perhaps was um, not able to do that, but if you're going to do a full-blooded community consultation, you need to ensure that you don't miss anybody, especially when they're going to put public art on an infrastructure uh, without uh, them having been involved in that consultation. I'll probably best to leave it at that because Thank at you. this stage, um, 
from a good governance perspective, I have to support and as chair of the RADF committee and being involved in that discussion, um, I'd have to support the, uh, the RADF committee's recommendation to the full council. Thank you, Councillor Churchill. I have a motion from Councillor Muscat and Councillor uh, Branthwaite has seconded that we support that recommendation in the, and in addition to that, the funding of $3,422.40 to Katrina Elliott. I think we've debated this enough, but Councillor Trevor has something to say. So I only have a Senate inquiry at two o'clock, but by all means. I'll see if I can drag it out then. Um, if you copy my fellow friend over here, you might be able to. <laughs> I, um, I, I just had one question in relation to the Turkey Beach birthday celebration, and I think your plan was to raise it because I was going to raise well, it. Well, they only asked for a hundred bucks. <laughs> and that's what you, exactly what you said, a hundred dollars. Um, and I just can't understand, uh, Chair um, of RADF, uh, why, why we just don't give them a hundred dollars. Well, there we are. They asked for a, asked for a hundred, we're giving them a hundred, but the project's 1300. No, they asked for 1300. No, they? no. Oh, no. sorry, that's... No. That's which is so mistake. confusing. No. I think if they'd asked for 1300 they probably would have got I, it. I can, I, I can answer the question quite simply. Yeah. The committee were very keen to be able to provide them for some additional funding. In actual fact, uh, as the chair, I made a suggestion which was not necessarily out of order. I said, well, how about we approve the 100 and put a couple of 100 to the side just in case they ask for more <laughs> later on? But that, that was not going to be part of a good my, fiscal yeah. governance yeah. Uh, process. My, my so, apologies. No, yeah. no, the, the, it was a lot of effort put into that wonderful application and it's significant 50 years uh, yeah. and, the, and the street signs and everything else hopefully everybody can make that one on the, in september but yeah it was only a hundred dollars well hopefully they apply for some other funds for an event or something like that to go towards supporting them because they don't ask for much and i think we'd love to support them but in the essence of time is there any further questions comments debate i'm going to put the motion moved by councillor muscat and seconded by councillor branthwaite all in favor those against Motion is carried. Thank you. We can have um, Councillor... Good luck, back in the room. <laughs> I don't know, it's been a revolving door. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Very good. All right. No. You certainly won't. All right, councillors. The next next item on the agenda is councillor reports. The only written councillor report is from myself um, and Gary Scanlon regarding the um, um, our manager of economic development, uh, the 2023 Smart Cities Summit and Expo. And I take the report as read. Uh, if you have questions, <laughs> no, it's a beautiful uh, report, Mr. Mayor, and uh, congratulations on all your efforts. I've got, Thank I've you. got a couple of questions or a point of clarification. So um, you'd want to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to have to hand as over brief as I can, as you would expect, uh, Gary. There's obviously very, and I, I mean a comprehensive report. It's fantastic. Uh, you indicated in there, I think, in the first page that there was over a hundred thousand uh, delegates attending. Uh, 100,000, or was that throughout the world online webinars and whatever? Or was, or was there 100,000 people all there at the conference? Uh, it felt like there was 100,000 people at the conference, but yeah, no, it was um, uh, across all platforms, so yeah. Okay, then. Um, and just uh, just honing in on a little bit, which was page or page 59 or 67 or whatever, you mentioned that uh, the, the, the 2050 net zero goals hydrogen will account for up to 12% of the energy mix. That's a statement that you made, or the Taiwan, Taiwan government indicating in March 2022. 20, 20, um, is, is, is that a national or is that relevant to Australia? Or Because the reason for my question is later on, when you make reference to Australia, Queensland, Central Queensland. So that's 12% of the national energy mix for Taiwan. Uh, so the Taiwanese government are looking at a, a raft of um, supply options for, for their hydrogen. Obviously, they, the reason they're looking for uh, national, uh, global supply options is that they don't have enough renewable energy to produ produce their own hydrogen. Oh, OK, then. Yeah. So they can't produce their own? So no, no, they don't have enough renewable energy to produce the level of hydrogen they need for the net zero. Yeah. All right. All right, so... Um my only other question was, uh, and I've just got to try and find it here, probably to you, uh, Mayor Matt, was yep. 
in relation to um, they're obviously uh, in was thus they're in need of investing or and or purchasing and or acquiring uh, hydrogen. And yes. you mentioned uh, that that there is focuses on Australia, Queensland, and Central Queensland. And I was wondering whether you it, it says it here Taiwan is looking to Australia, Queensland, and Central Queensland to provide the renewable energy that will drive their net zero ambitions for the countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, are you able to share with us uh, the level of uh, need, requirement or whatever, and is it going to be pertinent to Gladstone? So just to give you an example, um, China Steel Corporation require 284,000 tonnes of hydrogen just for their steel uh, production in Taiwan. If you looked at all our projects in totality and at capacity, we couldn't supply that demand. In Gladstone, so right. they've got a. That's just trying to steal for their Kaohsiung uh, development. So it'll be uh, an Australia, a Team Australia approach to supplying the hydrogen to North Asia and East Asia as well, and not and also necessarily Taiwan. So they have a huge demand, a massive demand, um, oh. and our opportunity for Gladstone is to get as much of that demand as we possibly can. So. Get our share. So that was obviously the intent in your terminology there that you've just mentioned Australia, Queensland and then Central Queensland. And not necessarily that you failed to put Gladstone in there, but you're identifying that Gladstone's only a small part of their need of investment in hydrogen. Yeah, and that's only one of their companies. Whilst it's a significant, one of their major mm -hmm. companies, um, trying to steal at that 284,000 tonnes is is a massive project, you know. It's mm -hmm. just the consumption. That, and that's just for their Kaohsiung Steelworks. You know, they've got 11 other steelworks yeah. so, around the world. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Gary, our economic yeah. development specialist. He helped you there, man. He did. He's pretty good. Um, he, excellent. That's why we brought him along. <laughs> um, we did, and I'm glad Gary mentioned China Steel. I think I've mentioned to councillors, certainly, um, in a message from uh, in Taiwan, that we did a presentation. Um, with no, nothing from Team Queensland that was with us, but most um, other organisations were, uh, councils were allocated 10 minutes, we were allocated half an hour, and we used all that and some. And then the chairman of China Steel asked us to represent the next day, which we did, um, and then has allocated us an officer, basically, a reasonably high officer, uh, to work with um, Team Gladstone about how we can help provide some of that hydrogen because we can't provide it all. And it is a central Queensland effort because we will be, we'll need renewable energy from our neighbouring councils as well to even come close. And that was just one of the proponents and there was a number of others as you can see from the report. Um, considering they flew me, they paid for my flights, accommodation, um, registration and everything, uh, cost council very little except for the f iPhone I lost. Um, sorry about that. Um, but we did have travel insurance so <laughs> we should get a new um, phone covered by travel insurance. But other than that it cost council very little uh, for our delegation. I thank um, Gary for attending and Luke uh, from the university and um, Cameron from the Engineering Alliance who attended with us um, and all did part of Team Gladstone, Team Queensland, very proud. And I have a Senate inquiry in seven minutes uh, regarding um, the impact of natural disasters on local roads and I will be presenting that. So if we're still going with council reports, I'll hand over to the Deputy Mayor at that point. Any further questions for Gary or myself? Yeah, I've got a resolution is that, that the report be received, is it? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Trevor, Councillor Goodluck. Um, all in favour? Sorry, Councillor Henson. Thank you, Desley. Oh, Desley, do you have a question before I put that? Your screen was yellow. Yeah, no, I um, just got two small items for the report, that's all. For that report? the My report. Oh, yours, OK, oh. thank you. All in favour? <laughs> Motion's carried. And um, um, now we go to Council reports. Do you have a Council report, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's right, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, the seventeen seventy festivals on this weekend, so um, I just wanted to make everybody aware that at um, four four fifty on Friday afternoon is the official opening, and at five o'clock is a reenactment, and then there's heaps and heaps of on um, over the weekend. Street parade at nine o'clock Saturday morning, and um, eleven a.m. is a welcome to country, and um, eleven thirty is the Grand Grand Steiner School presentation, and there's lots and lots to go on, and it goes for the three days. So um, don't miss that. It should be a fantastic weekend at seventeen seventy. The other thing, I just want to congratulate the um, all the organisers for Ride for Lives, um, the suicide awareness ride on the weekend. 
So they got over 300 um, motorcycle riders, which was fantastic for the ride. And um, then they had they all met at Yabobo um, when it was finished. So it was really good. They had um, some bands there and Councillor Churchill was playing his drums there. So that was great. Thank you for that. And um, and Eight Ball Akins was there. But it was a great um, um, event for everybody to get together and share their stories and um um, yeah, I just talked to each other basically on, you know, suicide awareness. So it was really great. So, so thank you to Mark and Karen and all the crew from Ride for Lives Australia. Tough. Thank you, Councillor O'Grady. And um, also in regards to 1770, the art show is tomorrow night um, and I'll be attending that as well as a number of councillors as well. So kickstarts the festival. Any further councillor reports? No? Um, <laughs> just in case there is, you've got to be quick. No? Well, there's a couple of quick ones. The Symphony Under the Stars, Friday night, Real Estate Industry Forum this Friday at the Entertainment Centre, and I think uh, the GCCI 2023 Business Expo is next uh, Thursday. So, yeah, a lot happening, hey? Fantastic. Yeah, Symphony Under the Stars will be unreal, no doubt, again. Actually, and Volunteer Week, too. Yeah, right? I was going to... That's how I was going to wrap up the meeting. You know, great minds think alike. We had a fantastic night at the um, Phillips Street Committee's precinct, Council Churchill and I, and a whole bunch of council staff and so many volunteers. And I know that councillors are attending a number of functions around the region. Thank you for that, and thank you to all our volunteers and National Volunteers Week. It was pretty much National Volunteers Month. And I will declare the meeting closed at 1.57pm. Thank you.